Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the f*** up. <laughs> You're listening to Believe You Me with Michael the Count Bisbing. You know my name yet? And Anthony Lionheart Smith. I'll do. I'll do it as we're going. But I, uh, I ran into uh, Perillo in Rockhold. Yeah. Is this is this fit, fit for the show or is it private? That's what I was trying to figure out. Like, I'll go on. We'll we'll, we'll keep. Up. Well, I mean, we had a good time, but uh, I, Luke reached out to my manager and wanted to meet up and have a drink and make amends. But this picture is hilarious. It's where there's a big mural behind us, and it's like me just smiling for the picture. It's like our commemoration picture, and he's got a banana in his hand, and he's like all the way on the. <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> And staying in the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was nice and very mature of him to reach out. Yeah, you know, he's actually not a bad guy. And we kind of talked through some of the talked through some of the bullshit. And I think we figured out why we had such a bad beef. Um, let me fix my camera right here. Yeah, it was good. It was actually good. He was enjoyable to talk to. I was actually uh I actually enjoyed myself. But good, the picture good. was bad timing with he had a big old banana in his hand. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Just and, biting into it. Yeah. Looking all sexual, looking at the camera, <laughs> yeah. posing whilst taking a bite of a banana. Right, right. Uh, no, Luke's a good guy. Luke's a good guy. Um, fair play to him. I'll tell you what was good, though. This past weekend of fights. Yeah. UFC yeah. 299, one of the best events in recent memory. In fact, I'm struggling to think of a better night of fights that I enjoyed more, even though... Obviously, I'm good friends with Marlon Vera. Didn't enjoy seeing that. And Garnu getting flatlined. Didn't enjoy seeing that, but it was still impressive. It was still an uh, an insane event. An insane, I don't know, what's the word? It's just, uh, I don't know, it was, a, it was a big deal. Like, it, it felt was. big. It was a big, uh, a big event. It was, I don't know, it was like, it, it felt big the whole time I was there. Um God, I, was, I worked so hard though. I felt like I didn't, I didn't get enough sleep. I was just working. We did. I felt like we did a billion shows. It was just so oh, yeah. much hype and attention. Oh, oh, you were doing a lot of shows. You, you were live streaming with Daniel Cormier. On I have YouTube no channel. idea how that happened. So, <laughs> the Ngannou like, this fight guy's was cheating on me. So, so I'm, I'm doing a live on mine. Yeah. Right, for the Ngannou fight, just like you know, fight companion type thing. You're there living it up. DC, Corey Sandagen, Anthony Smith, you know, a who's who of mixed martial arts. I'm sitting here with my wife, Billy No Mates over here. And then on the chat, someone's like, oh, FYI, DC is doing a live stream as well. So I look at DC because someone, someone was talking crap about how many people were watching his and watching mine. So I went on it and I looked and I'm like, what the hell? Anthony <laughs> Smith. And then two minutes later, you FaceTime me. Oh, it was hilarious. Yeah, it was. I don't know how that happened, though. This is the most DC shit ever. I come downstairs to meet my manager to watch the Ngano fight with him. But there's when I come down into the first room, it's just all the ESPN staff, you know, the camera people, the lighting people, the sound people, all the people I typically hang out with. Yeah. And then I don't see Lloyd. So I'm like, I, I asked Sarah, like, where's Lloyd actually? Oh, he's in the back room. Sandhagen's over there. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll go say hi to Lloyd and I'll come back and hang out with my friends. And then I walk in the room and DC's got a whole camera set up. He's got microphones. He's got all this shit set up. And Corey Sandhagen's sitting on this couch with him. And so as soon as I walk in, it, this is where the most DC thing comes in. Oh, Anthony, come over here and sit down. I'm like, okay, well, I'll sit down for a second and chat with DC. And next thing I know, Sandhagen leaves. And it's just me and DC for the rest of the fight. I was like, well, this wasn't the plan. Well, fortunately for you, it didn't last very long. I mean, I guess we'll start with yeah. that because Francis Ngannou, fair play to him, what he did against Tyson Fury, shocked the world, looked impressive, made a fortune, made a ton of money. So I'm happy for him in that regard. I guess Anthony Joshua. I mean, when the fight started, I was like, oh. And by the way, I was all... I was balls deep on Ngannou. I was like, he's going to win this fight. You mm -hmm. know, what I mean? he impressed me so much against Tyson Fury. I guess I was just carried away by the romance of the moment. Do you know what I mean? I was like, we can do it. We can do it. He's one of us. Um, yeah, no, that, that that was far from the truth. But to be fair, what happened there is what should happen when a mixed martial artist fights one of the very best boxers on the planet. Mm -hmm. And Garnu started aggressive, started throwing a few shots. I was like, whoa, he looks confident. He looks skilled. He looks fast. Uh, and on the flip side, Joshua was just taking his time. 
Just just chill, chill, chill. And that's the difference right there because Ngannou physically can throw shots. Is it coordinated enough to where he can throw a good punch and all the rest of it? Of course he can. Um, but it's not about that. It's about looking at your opponent and waiting and seeing seeing what he gives you, looking for the openings, right? I'm going to throw this right hand as soon. Look at his patterns. Look, look at his movement patterns. All right, okay, now I've got you. And he just waited. Woof, that first shot that he threw. Absolutely perfect. Boom, sat him down. Same in round two. And then the follow-up. Just to be honest, you, you got to uh, you got to admire that. It was beautiful, beautiful, uh, the timing and the power of that. Yeah, it was, it, Joshua looked incredible even physically he looked really fast faster than maybe we've seen him in the past but I, it seems to me anthony joshua took francis and Gano a whole lot more serious maybe than tyson fury did and maybe that's and maybe that's what we have to maybe accept a little bit that maybe tyson fury slept on francis just a tad and i think we have done that to a point um but you're right that's exactly what should have happened in the tyson fury fight but to be fair, Tyson Fury and, and Anthony Joshua are two completely different styles of fighters. Tyson Fury is more of a, I don't know, an accumulation guy. Not that he doesn't have the one-punch knockout power, but Francis has always been known to have a good chin. And I think in order to do that to Francis, you're going to have to have the type of speed and power that Anthony Joshua has. I think just that style of – I still think that if Francis and Tyson were to fight again, I, I, think, it would be, I think it would be competitive. I really do. Mm. Um, just because I think the styles do make make for different fights. Anthony Josh was just as big, hits just as hard as Francis, but also has the the athleticism and the speed and the and the just that overall, you know, it, just his athleticism makes it different. And it was sad, but I don't feel that sad for Francis. Like no, no, he, he made twenty million dollars, so I, I I know it sucks. It's embarrassing. Got some egg on your face right now. Um. You still have great opportunities ahead of you, and you made an absolute shit ton of money. Um, so hats off to Francis and Gunner. Yeah, know. yeah, no fair play. I mean, how could you not like the guy afterwards? Right. I saw a clip doing the rounds where they asked him if the knockout hurt or something, and he's like, I didn't feel it. <laughs> and, and and he said, that's the beauty of a knockout. And I must admit, like, for example, when I got knocked out of UFC 100 against Dan Henderson, didn't feel a thing. And then afterwards, I wasn't even sore. My jaw wasn't hurting or anything like that. Yeah, put me to sleep. Didn't know where I was for bloody hours. But um, that is the benefit of getting sparked out cold. Yeah, getting you're, not present. Down, <laughs> you're not present. You're not present. Five rounds, kind of like Cheeto did. And we'll get to that in a little bit. And congratulations to Sean O'Malley. Yeah, that hurts. But the one punch knockout, boom. And it wasn't one. It was two or three big ones. But yeah, they don't hurt. But the fact that he was able to laugh and kind of be self-deprecating and, and laugh at his own demise, if you will. Yeah. It's endearing. It really is, you know. So fair play to him. I thought Anthony Joshua handled himself with absolute class. He didn't even really celebrate. And I guess that was because, as we know, as we just said, that's what should happen. Yeah, you know, he probably was like it, that. That's exactly how this should have went. If it went any other way, then I messed up. Mm. Yeah, and it's because Tyson Fury, as, as we saw, he did come into that one very heavy. And yeah. even though he said at the time that he trained, you got to understand, Anthony Joshua. This is this is a, a compliment, not an insult. He, he's an athlete. And the man takes his career very seriously. Yeah, of course, he's a fighter. Of course, he is. But Tyson Fury is the type of guy that, you know, ballooned up to over 400 pounds. He was addicted to drugs. He was partying and all this kind of stuff. You know, he had a problem with alcohol and whatnot. And you can see he's probably still that kind of jack the lad, for want of a better yeah. word. He's still one of the boys. He'll still get down. and He'll still probably have a little party. I don't know if he does, but I'm sure he does a little bit. Whereas Anthony Joshua, you know, the, the, I've seen after his fights, he's having a recovery swim on Sundays. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm still hungover on a Sunday. Yeah. I ain't going yeah. near a gym. But Anthony Joshua's, you know, counting his calories and going for a brisk walk. So, he's, a, uh, he's a consummate professional. So that... Yeah. And and I I I thought it was really cool how he handled himself afterwards, and as far as the you know the post he made, where I don't think that he enjoys kind of shutting down Francis's kind of hype train like that. I don't think that he enjoys. Of course, he wants to win, and if you have to choose, it's going to be him. And you know, if it's me or him, he's going to choose me every time. But I don't think that that means he enjoys, you know, stopping the the rise of somebody else. So um, I gained a lot of respect for Anthony Joshua. At times I've kind of thought he was a bit of a pussy 
uh, the way that he negotiates some of his. I'm just being honest. Like he he's not the he's a businessman. He's a businessman and he's an athlete, and he takes everything. He, he approaches everything in that way. I think sometimes as fans, we want people just to be fighters and go step in and put themselves in rough spots and see what happens. And he refuses to do that. And it bothers me sometimes. <laughs> so Listen, I, I get I, it. I, I tell you who did have a little bit of egg on his face, Tyson Fury, when they cut to his face, he was standing in the, the crowd and he was just, he looked embarrassed. He looked like a little sulky. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Not talking shit. He's a legend. Yeah. He's a great boxer. He's still got a great future and he's had an incredible career and he's undefeated. Mm-hmm. But he needed Francis to do well. He needed Francis to do well. He got sparked mm-hmm. out, right? Mm-hmm. With every punch that Joshua landed, it connected and hurt him. Uh, that, 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 that stings, especially when you understand how much shit Tyson Fury has talked about Francis Ngannou, just calls him a bodybuilder and stuff like that. But even still in that moment, Joshua didn't lower himself to having a go at Tyson Fury. And again, all class, all and class. That's what I want. <laughs> Cause he's a better man than me. Oh, yeah. Imagine the same situation. I'd have been like, yo, Tyson, I see you there, buddy. What do you think of that? What do you think? You you almost got beat. You got dragged. You got dropped. You know? You mm-hmm. were embarrassed. I just stood up for boxing. This guy's not boxing. even awake yet. <laughs> yeah, That's and, what oh I my God. He was out forever. <laughs> he was on oxygen for crying out loud. I know. And I would have said that and said, this guy about beat the shit out of you. And he's someone else is helping him get some more air. Oh dear. But oh dear. Anyway, either way, I don't want to talk bad about Francis. I no, no. Hats no. off to him. He 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 did one of those those daring greatly things. And I'll never talk shit about someone who does that. He made a shit ton of money. It's a life changing experience. He had in two fights. That guy's winning. Oh, he's winning life. He, he's won. He's won. Yeah. I, I think he got like 6 million against Fury 20 for that one. That's 26 million on top of the money that he had before. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. God bless him. Good for him. Well mm-hmm. done. He might still have, some opportunity to box some names, you know, like a Deontay Wilder. It's like Wild, Wilder's still there. The Wilder Wilder's is still there. on the table. You know, maybe like a Derek Chisora and Andy Ruiz. There's probably still some opportunity for him to get some big paydays. Mm-hmm. Nothing like that, though. I don't think no. they would put him top of the bill, marquee, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But maybe on the undercard, maybe still get some. Maybe know, a co main. Yeah. Like a yeah they don't, versus, well, they don't really name. do that in boxing. What do they, they call them? I mean? What do they call them instead of co mains? They call them featured bout, supporting, support, whatever. I don't remember. But either way, like, yeah, like one of the fights that, you know, right before yeah. the, the, you know, the we'll go with co main. We'll, we'll go with co main. Yeah. We'll call, call it that. Call I don't know what it's actually called. Well, well done to Anthony Joshua. Well done to Francis Ngannou. And hopefully we see him back in mixed martial arts soon. Anyway, moving on, because UFC 299 happened at the weekend, and we are all about that. Um, as I said at the start, what a night of fights. Just yeah. unbelievable. That main card was absolutely phenomenal. we got to start with the main event. Cheeto Vera, as we know, historically has been a slow starter, and that has cost him on occasion. Um, Perillo told me that was a big focus of the camp. I thought given all the buzz, given the opportunity, fighting for the title, given the fact that Ecuadorians were all over the place and hyping him up, I thought he was going to come out a bit more aggressive. But it's hard to do that against somebody so skilled as Sean O'Malley because he has got better with every single fight. Every time we see him, he's improved. He is faster. He's more powerful. He's hitting harder. He's planting his feet. The footwork's improved the shot selection, the the way he buries the attacks, everything. So it was really hard for Marlon to kind of get going because he just wasn't there to counter. He wasn't there to hit with the length, with the speed, and then the in and out movement. Sean O'Malley was utterly phenomenal. It was magical to watch. And and, and again, Cheeto, obviously, we we got a lot of love for Cheeto. So that was, you know, it was tough to watch. But, man, I, I cannot discredit. Like, I, I don't know that Cheeto did a whole lot wrong because it, it looked like he tried to start fast and O'Malley just did a really good job of just managing the distance. And and I think Chael made a good point of this. We talk about managing distance all the time in this game. You got to manage the distance. You, you know, he manages the range. It's been a long time since I've seen someone do it as well as Sean O'Malley did on Saturday night. He just, he always kept something in that gray area that always kept Cheeto kind of not able to advance he attacked his legs early, went to the body early, 
Cheeto's got an iron chin on him. But whether you can take him or not, you don't want to. They don't feel great. So he just constantly gave he, – he made Cheeto think way more than he wanted to. And it, you, Cheeto does really well when he gets in that flow state and he just is moving forward. He's, he's marching forward. He's taking, taking ground from people and, and putting heavy shots on him. And at times he was able to do that towards the end of the round. And, and, and I thought O'Malley, who I believe at times has had some conditioning issues. Um, I don't want to say conditioning issues, but he hasn't managed it as well. I thought he managed his, his energy really, really well. It, Towards the end of the round, you could tell he was kind of taking, a back, taking the foot off the gas a little bit to conserve it. And then Cheeto was able to kind of push forward and put some shots on him towards the end of the rounds. But um, I, I really can't take anything away from Cheeto. It, it, I really can only build well, up Sean O'Malley. Cause he, I, I guess in, in terms of what he did wrong, and that seems like a... It seems like a bitchy term to use, but mm-hmm. there were some there were some things he could have done better for sure because he clearly showed he had the the ability to hurt him. And when he did pull the trigger and go for it, the problems he had is he's not as fast, he's not as tall or long. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he's not he's, he's not as fast and he's not as long, mm-hmm. but he's got more power. And when he did go, he would hurt him every right. single time. So what he needed to do was to have that initial attack but then go again, continue and maintain the pressure. Because anytime he did that, Sean O'Malley wouldn't fall apart because he can fight going backwards. But when you're under pressure, you can't sit there. You're not in control. You're not having a good time. Look, most of the time, O'Malley was at range. He was safe. He was fine. He was picking him apart. He was using the straight shots, coming up the middle with the knees, the head kicks, whatever. When O'Malley, would, sorry, when Vera would attack, that changes. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. he's in a defensive posture. He's not attacking. He's backing up, and Cheeto was hitting him. What he had to do then was then go again, continue and maintain that pressure. Of course, right. easier said than done, but that's what he has to do. He had to go more. You know, I understand well, I think he's got to give him more to look at, too. That's I, I think for anybody that's going to beat uh, Sean O'Malley, you got to give him more things than just the ones and the twos to worry about. I think that Cheeto could have done a better job attacking his legs low. Um, and at least I'm not saying that there's any chance that that same situation is going to happen that, that like it happened in the first fight. It's very unlikely, but at least slow him down a little bit. You, uh, attack his footwork, like chop, chop. And, and Sean did a good job in the first couple rounds of every time Cheeto, if, if Sean or if Cheeto was orthodox, Sean would go southpaw. And if Cheeto would switch to go to the kick, then Sean would switch. So he always stayed in the opposite stance of Cheeto on purpose. And I believe that's to protect his legs, but. Mm. He's a bit of a liability at his legs. If you can chop those down just a little bit and just take a little bit of heat off of his footwork, I think that would have been successful. And not that Cheeto's a great wrestler or or known to be a wrestler. At least the attempts will give Sean O'Malley something else to look at. As you say, uh, your words, he's weak in the legs. As it, there's a give and a take, isn't there, it, mm-hmm. in everything. If you're tall and you're long, you're going to have skinny legs. Yeah. You know, so therefore they can't take as much damage and maybe not quite as powerful. That said, when you wrap those skinny legs around somebody, they hurt more. If you're extremely explosive, then you're not going to have as good cardio. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? If you're really strong, right. you know, there's, there's always a give and a take. So the, the, the positive there for Cheetah, and there's many positives, by the way, yet yeah, tall and long, but it does have, you know, somewhat toothpick-esque legs. That will well, be problematic. I think there's some give and a take in Sean's style as well. I don't know, necessarily know that it's 100% his, the size of his legs. A lot of it's his style. If you're tall and rangy and, and you, you, you do a really good job with these straight punches and, and, and you're kind of a sniper on the outside, you do have to set your feet when you go. So if, you're, if that's the type of style that you fight, then you're going to be a little bit susceptible to leg kicks because you're yep. planted. If you're really good at checking leg kicks. You're not necessarily going to have the same kind of power and speed with your hands because you're not, you're not anchored to the, to the ground. So, and it's the same problem that I'm running into now trying to figure out how to weave in and out of those two stances, because what I really want to do is anchor myself and shoot those straight shots from the outside. while people are figuring out or have figured out that if you, if you attack my leg, then I, I'm not like I have to change that. I have to start moving around more. Like if I'm anchored, I'll knock anybody out. But I can't do that anymore. So now I'm starting to check the leg kicks and stuff, but I don't have the same power in my hands like I used to because I'm not I'm not I'm mm. not centered to the to the ground anymore. So 
and and I think Sean is doing a really good job of figuring that out. He uses the stance switches a lot to to throw off the leg kicks. I thought that that was really interesting how him and his team, instead of worrying about checking the leg kicks, they just go in and out of southpaw and orthodox. So we'll go to orthodox, bang people up a little bit, and then as soon as they think that kick's going to start coming, they'll switch back. And it, I, I thought that they had a really great game plan, and so I don't want to – I guess I'm saying this because I don't want to take too much away from Cheeto because I thought he fought really well with what he has, and he obviously could have done some things different and better, and we can, Mon- we can Monday morning quarterback it all day. But I thought that Sean O'Malley's game plan execution and his, mm-hmm. and his growth since even his last fight it was just a lot more – was a lot more than I think anybody expected. Without question, it's more a case of what O'Malley did well because mm-hmm. you only got to take one look at that, not even as a trained fighter, and see, wow, that guy there is extremely skilled yeah. and polished. That guy's fast. fucking good. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, he's fucking good. Uh, I would have liked to have seen more head movement. I would have liked to see more parries and, and mm-hmm. slips and stuff from Cheeto. We could go on all day. But as I said, it was more about what O'Malley did. Tell you what, though, Cheeto, what a chin. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. I mean, that knee in round two. The sound of that was sickening. It really was. And now he stayed on the feet, continued to fight, nearly got him out of there with the final punch of the fight to the liver in round five. That's what I'm saying. I was talking about it on my YouTube channel. I think when Chido watches that back, he's going to hate it. He's going he's gonna to be annoyed and disappointed with himself. Mm-hmm. You know, he could yeah. have done a bit more, but, you know, as we say, it's easy for us to say because, yeah. you know, we weren't the ones in there. And I thought he showed the heart of a lion. He should still be very, very proud of himself. Yeah, okay, oh, yeah. it wasn't a perfect fight. R- rarely are they. The problem was he was fighting somebody in O'Malley that did have a perfect night. He was a about perfect, perfect night. Was that about was about perfect. perfect. It really yeah. was. Listen, yeah, okay, uh, uh, Cheeto got through, but it was still a pretty perfect night against a really tough opponent mm-hmm. in Cheeto. Um, I mean, his stock just went through the roof. It yeah. did. I mean, he talk about living up to the moment. Became the champion, knocked out Aljamain Sterling, beats Cheeto Vera in utterly convincing fashion, getting more and more powerful. I mean, mm-hmm. the, 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 those right hands, they were vicious. The jabs, the head kicks, everything about him, the evolution from when he first started, you mm-hmm. know. And it makes you have a bit more respect for guys like Chris Martino and Thomas Almeida and the guys that yeah. have stopped in the past because you think, shit, they, they, you know, the man has got some serious power. Um, Ilya Taporia, Dana. Send the jet. I'm going yeah. to Spain. I'm looking for Ilya Taporia. Yeah, easy, 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 easy. Hold easy on. Easy, Tiger. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Give me your thoughts on that. Um. Well, I think just generally as a fan, I'd like to see both of these guys fight in their own divisions for a little bit first. Um, I don't want to hold I, – I would hate to hold up two divisions that are thriving right now. 135 is a is a hotbed right now. So let's not you, let's not build this thing up and then put the brakes on it so we can have this you know this double champ thing. I understand why he wants that, and I I support all the success in the world and all the money making opportunities for Sean O'Malley. But there's you know there's Umar Nurmagomedov, there's uh, Corey Sandhagen, there's Marab, there's I mean it's a it, it's a mess right now in a good way. And I think 145 is 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 heating up as well. There's there's a couple pretty good contenders there that uh, there's a Max Holloway fight that's about to happen. I can't. I, I would be shocked if Max Holloway beats Justin Gaethje and then doesn't get a title shot. Um, and I think there's a couple other really interesting opportunities for for Ilya. And I don't think Taporia would do that to Marab <laughs> because they are so close. Oh yeah, the Georgian connection. They're both Georgians. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree with everything that you're saying. So I, I'm sorry, no way am I advocating for Sean O'Malley to step up. I think there should be a hard and fast rule unless there's no clear-cut contenders. You've got to defend about three times before you move up. But just if we're playing in the spirit of avo- Devil's yeah. Avocado, right? think about it like this. Sean O'Malley gets the jet from Dana, flies off to Spain, we have the fight relatively quick turnaround because he just fought as well. That mm-hmm. gives Volkanovski a bit more time to rest and recover, you know, I, I, and just for just for the sheer spectacle of it, you know, as of, I mean, I would like, if they could do it quick, Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily, listen. Who wins? You got to fight, you got to fight the contenders. Of course you do. We know that. But if they're willing to do it quickly, quickly, so the rest of the division doesn't have to wait. Marab just fought. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? 
Um, he can hang out for a minute. He just fought. If they're willing to do it quick, get the jet. Book it. <laughs> Who uh, wins? What's it called? Burn the Bow Arena. Ilya Taporia, Sugar Sean O'Malley. Sugar Sean O'Malley's probably going to get beat. Let's be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, after seeing that Saturday night, I don't know. It's easy to say that because Volkanovski is a shorter guy. Yeah. Tapori is a shorter guy. Mm -hmm. Get him past those hands, man. They are lightning. They See, are quick. I think if he can avoid the big shot, but God damn, the, the grappling of Taporia. That's what that's, I was talking about with Cheeto is giving him some more things to worry about. Taporia mixes it up so well. He's grappling. He's shooting. He's attacking the legs. He's a great boxer, crazy power in his hands. He's the full package. Uh, I think at times Cheeto made, and I, I think it was be just the way that he fought. He fought a little bit limited game, which is kind of tailor made for a Sean O'Malley style of fight. Because look what he did, to Aljo. Aljo didn't have the ability to just strike with him. And if you only got one thing to really worry about, it makes it for an easier fight. It's predictable. But I'm not saying I wouldn't watch it. I would watch who, the absolute who, shit. Who out of was that. It that just came out and was talking shit. Ben Askren said something about. I love Ben, but what was he talking about? <laughs> what did he say? Does, does it, is it relevant to this fight? I think he was talking about Sugar Sean O'Malley. And he said, remember, Sean O'Malley lost to someone. And O'Malley came out and said, yeah, remember, you got knocked out of Jake Paul. <laughs> I, thought, oh, I can't remember what it was. No, ben Askren can't say shit to anybody because that's what everyone's going to come back with. Even no, if he's right. Can't. Even if he's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, but I forget what it was why he was talking shit to O'Malley, but still. Uh, congratulations, O'Malley, man. I mean, he called it, didn't he? I hate to say it. He manifested this. Everyone's manifesting everything, okay? If you're working towards something, you're trying to make it a reality. So stop saying that. Just say, I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the buzzword, isn't it? Everyone's it saying, oh, man, I manifested this. What you mean? You made a conscious effort to work at something. Right. No one manifests through. a loss. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm manifesting this. Yeah, right, yeah. that's what happened. I, I manifested this loss. That's the only reason it happened. Sugar Sean O'Malley, is he one of the biggest stars in the UFC right now? I think so. I think so. I was actually really impressed with the amount of Ecuadorian support that Cheeto had. They were chanting. Having to put it here. So, sorry, sorry. Uh, he said, uh, here's what uh, Ben Askren said. Just a reminder, Piotrian, uh beat Sean. Judges robbed him. And then that's when O'Malley came back. He said, just a reminder, J. Paul knocked you out. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> nice work, Harrington. <laughs> oh, dear. I wonder what, what motivated Ben Askren to come out and say that. That's kind of a bitchy statement. Yeah. Uh, it's a bitchy kinda, statement. That, Let the man no, it, I'm, oh, it definitely is. That's just kind of, that's Ben. I think he likes to poke at people and enjoys it. Well, he likes to insert himself and keep himself relevant, I guess. you got to do something. If it yep. comes from nothing but good old-fashioned shit talk, mm, then right. so... Be it. Um, all right, today's episode is sponsored by Eight Sleep, and these are one of my favorite sponsors because I love this device. They solve the age-old sleeping problem. If you share a bed with a loved one, it's either too hot or it's too cold. Well, that doesn't matter. That's a thing of the past because the Eight Sleeps pod technology, you can cool down the bed on either side. She can have it hot, you can have it cold, or whichever you want. You can go as low as 55 degrees or as high as 110 degrees. Sleep science shows that in order to to sleep the best the body needs to drop in the early and middle part of the sleep and then rise again in the morning the pod cover will improve your sleep by automatically adjusting your bed's temperature based on your individual needs and i said it goes from 55 to 110 degrees in addition to keeping you at the perfect temperature all night the pod also attracts your sleep and your health metrics and they saw that their sleep quality improved by 32 percent by just after one month using the eight sleep pod so there's no better way to improve your sleep you're going to love this thing you're going to sleep better you're going to be more comfortable you're going to be more productive the next day and it's just nice and it's a cool piece of technology man it's unreal and it stops the arguments well it has done in my house anyway so right now give it a shot go to eightsleep.com slash bisping to get two hundred dollars off and free shipping i'm telling you right now this will revolutionize the way you sleep you will feel fantastic and you're going to get two hundred dollars off when you go to eightsleep.com slash bisping two hundred dollars off and free shipping. What were we just talking about? We were slightly switching gears. Oh, um, oh, O'Malley, O'Malley, the, yeah. the starness, mm -hmm. the stardom, should I say. You know, he's been making a lot of comparisons to Conor McGregor in a very, very um, 
respectful way, saying he he watched everything about McGregor, all his interviews, and he's kind of, you know, trying try, trying to do the same thing, trying to become that kind of guy. Yeah. Um, who do you think is the biggest star in the UFC right now? Biggest stars in UFC. I put a tweet out on this yesterday. Obviously, we've got Conor McGregor. Right. Outside well, of Conor maybe, McGregor, what would you top five? Maybe. Be? When's the last time Conor sold a ticket? Well, there is that. But O'Malley, but, John Jones. I would say Pereira. O'Malley, John Jones, Pereira. Izzy. 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 Um, Dustin Poirier after that. Dustin Poirier, for we'll, sure. We'll that was that. insane. Now, I'm, not even talking the fight. I'm not even talking about the fight. We're talking star power and how much people love fighters. Dustin Poirier is a much larger, and we already know that Dustin is popular and people love him um, and all of that stuff. I was, as much as I knew people loved him, I was blown away at the amount of support that that guy has it, and how much people really love him. It was insane. They bombarded the post show the whole time Taporia? he was on. Taporia, is he up there yet, you think? He's got to be close because of the the Spain oh. and Georgia support. I don't know how how crazy super popular he is in the in America, but I think you know across the board, yeah. Chandler, Chandler's pretty popular. I don't know Olivera. that he's above. Yeah, I don't know that either one of those people are above like an Izzy Pereira and kind of where O'Malley is now, but they're up Strickland. there. Strickland, sure. yeah, I think it's dying down a little bit on the Strickland thing. I think he's yeah. still. I think he's still very popular. And sorry. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. He, he's very popular with a certain demographic and a certain. Right. He's polarizing. You know what I mean. He's so, popular with a very loud group of people. A loud minority. I don't know if they're a minority. I think he does have some star power, but um, it, it, I think be, at times it seems much louder than maybe it actually is. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see the pay per view numbers. Because that's what talks at the end of the day. You want to talk about right. people's star power. How many pay-per-views did it sell? Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, okay, granted, the whole card does factor into that. But a lot of the time, yeah. the main event is what sells a pay-per-view. Okay, so we talk, we're talking star power and popularity. Who do you think sells more pay-per-views? Because Instagram follows and social media interactions don't necessarily always equate to pay-per-view sales, right? Yep. So. Who do you think out of out of kind of those handful of people we talked at the top? Who do you think sells more pay per views? I mean, John Jones has got to be in the discussion right there. Maybe. You know, I'd say right now probably Dustin Poirier. In my, opinion. you think so? I think so. I think so. I think some of it is is the whole the time. I mean, the people are loving Alex Pereira. Yeah, they but love Alex Pereira. Did they do? I, I think I think about the the how would you know, Brian, feel free to chime in. I think about the demographic of people that are that are, are a part of your fan group. So like we talk a lot about Sean O'Malley tapping into this younger generation of fans. Like he's very, very polarizing to like the TikTok generation. But does that generation of people equate to pay-per-view buys? You know what I mean? That generation of people no where to find the illegal streams they're I, very I mean, very they, they're pirate they were, that's what i'm saying they were raised with the online culture we mm -hmm. have adapted to it and it's blended into part of our everyday life as we've got older now, i'm a bit older than you but when i was younger phones weren't a thing right. you know what i mean social media was not a thing this new generation that's all they've known you mm -hmm. know i have to explain to my children what it was like before you know what I mean? Right. When there wasn't, when I grew up in England, there was four channels on the TV. You know what I mean? <laughs> that blows their minds. They can't believe that. The children's programs were on from 3.30 p.m. to 5 o'clock. And that was it. You didn't catch your cartoons at that time. Unlucky. They're done. You know what I mean? There was no reruns. Your favorite show. Your favorite show, if you wanted to watch it, that was it. You had one opportunity. You had to be in front of the TV at that time. Oh, sit down, popcorn, or your can of Coke or whatever it was, ready to go. You missed that. You were gutted. Like, ah, it's gone forever. How are you ever going to – no reruns, <laughs> right. no DVDs, no yeah. looking at it on YouTube. No recording it. No. Yeah. Crazy. You know? But yeah. I do – I, and I don't, I don't have any numbers or, or been told this by anybody or, or have any, uh, that's just my theory is that the, the demographic of people that Sean has tapped into 
that, that no other fighter really has had the ability to. I don't know that those people are, are, are transferring over to pay-per-view buys. I always feel like Dustin Poirier is kind of like that blue collar guy that goes to work every single day type of type of fighter that everyone loves him for that. He's that, that, that hardworking, you know, Louisiana soul that everybody loves. And I think that probably transfers to pay-per-view buys fairly easily. So let's, let's, let's put that into a couple of concise sentences. You're saying that Sean O'Malley's fan base is TikTok generation that will not buy pay-per-views because they're going to find a stream and they know how to do it. Dustin Poirier's demographic and fan base is hard-working mechanics. They're on the building side. They come back. They're kicking back with a couple of beers. They're putting the pay-per-view on. They're having the boys over and the barbecue and some ribs. Likely, yeah, actually. But I would imagine that Sean O'Malley's popularity of stardom and his, his fan base probably transfers over to more money outside of the octagon than probably mm. Dustin Poirier because he does have such a big base. It's a lot easier to get. Then your Instagram followers really do matter and your social media presence does matter because you have the opportunity to sell that to your, to your fan base and your endorsements are probably larger. Herringbone is making the first appearance on the Ooh. show. He's looking dark. He's right, looking mute. What we got? <laughs> do you have sound? I do. Okay. It's rather echoey and loud, but that's okay. It's a start. Okay. All right. I'll uh, I'll, I'll limit my voice. So I I think you're finding with Sean O'Malley. I I agree with you. You're you're right about maybe not the pay per view buys being there, but he's made the same pivot that recording artists have, where now they're able to charge an insane amount for his gate. That that live gate, I think they said, was the fourth highest in UFC history. So while he might not generate with the pay-per-view sales, those guys with the pink hair are going to show up and buy tickets at exorbitant prices anytime Sean O'Malley's live. But yeah. as a, like, Do you get a cut of that, Michael, as a champion? No, not to my knowledge. Now, now maybe once you re reach a certain level, you can negotiate that further. I mean, contracts mm -hmm. can always be negotiated. My right. contract, no. I can't speak for every champion there's ever been. Right. I just didn't you know, know if that's so. something you ever heard of or, or anything. Yeah, else. not to my knowledge. I don't know, though. I wouldn't like to say yes or no, but I haven't heard of that. Wouldn't right. surprise me if McGregor does. But um, but you've also got a fact to win, though. That fight card, 299, and we're going to get to the rest of the fights, everybody, was ridiculous. People were all saying, oh, it's better than 300. Who cares? You're spoiled. If that's yeah. your real yeah. issue... If that's your issue, you're spoiled. You know what I mean? It's a good problem mm -hmm. to have. I think that's probably why the gate was so high. But, of course, that helps O'Malley, and it helps build the star. And mm -hmm. performances like that help build the star. Like McGregor, when he was on that crazy run, John Bowes Jones, Ronda Rousey, when people have this air of invincibility about them. And now, you know, you could make the argument that Sean can now actually say that he's undefeated because he's kind of, he's got the loss back. He beat Cheeto in convincing mm -hmm. fashion. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying it's eradicated, but if you get revenge for your losses, it certainly helps that argument. It, it does. It does. But again, um, it, it's a, it happens. Because I, I can't say that because I've had situations happen where I've been hurt in fights and it's caused me to lose. And I'm, it's a, if I got to eat it, so do you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I feel about so, it. No, congratulations, Sugar Sean O'Malley. If you had to pick one name real quick, Taporia, Marab, Sandhagen, Nurmagomedov, brother. Which name would this be? Sandhagen. Sandhagen. That's the fight that interests me the most. I agree. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, it interests me more. And and I don't want to shit on Marab. But, oh. but you know, I feel bad about that. But as far as the interest into the X's and the O's and what I think happens in there, I think the only person that can stand in front of Sean O'Malley and be competitive at his level and play in his game is Corey Sandhagen. Brother, you answered my question without me asking this. I was going to say to you, as uh, stylistically, these three opponents, who has bigger style or biggest chance to take belt from Sean? It's St. Egan. You don't think Umar Namargomedov has a real chance? You don't think Marab Davalashvili? With the oh, they <laughs> crazy pressure, bro. And he's joining Yes, us. but it's hey, crazy Marab. predictable. It's but crazy predictable. The man I watched on Saturday night, name. you got to be better. you got to be better than having name. one thing. You don't say my name. I want. I I win all the fights, and you don't <laughs> even say my name. And what did he say? Hey, listen, Sean O'Malley. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds like Marab. It kind of does. Yeah, yeah. It kind of does. Hey, you don't say my name. Um, who do you think? 
I think maybe Sunday again he can do it all. And he's got yeah. the height, he's got the striking, but so does bloody no Maga Madoff. Yeah, I, I just, I, and, and I'm not saying that Umar couldn't win. I, I think we haven't seen him enough at, at the highest level to really get us pining for him to get a title shot, but, and, and, and convince us that he could go in there and win. I, we suspect he could, but I just think he's crazy predictable. I think, I mean, we've seen what O'Malley did to a guy that he was expecting to wrestle. We've mm. seen what he, we just seen what he did to two people well, one and a half people that he suspected were only going to strike. I, I just think that he's the type of fighter that, like, remind, reminds me one of John Jones. One and a Jones. half people? Yeah, I was going to say Piotr Jan, but, you know, like, some half the he's, listeners he's are going to say. He's very little, so he only, he only counts as half. No, I was going to say, he only, he only, only half, half, he no, half no, outstruck him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and by the way, we just said, there's no disrespect to Marab. No, but Marab. No. Marab should be next, but I want to watch Sandhagen more. Marab probably will be next. Mm -hmm. I feel like, but his style is definitely. Um, it was just. But who his, knows? Maybe Marab runs in there and gets yes, the fuck out. Knows. I, I don't know. I don't know. Because this guy is very good and he's getting better as well. He drop in and he's a hudo. Um, who fucking knows? Listen, they're all great. It's a good what a problem. Great division. To have. Yeah, what a great it's division. Going all I mean, yeah, if you look at the rankings now, it's on fire, isn't oh, that's it? That's a shit yeah, problem. Man. That's a shit problem for Sean O'Malley. Every time you well, win, the, the reward for that is a tougher fight next. <laughs> but sucks. you want big fights that interest the public. Excuse yeah. me. So he's got Marab, the Sandagan. Piotr Jan has been there, done that. Yeah, I don't think he's going to have to bother with that anytime soon. I don't know. Piotr Jan looked pretty goddamn good on Saturday. I have a sneeze coming. Oh, shit. You're not going to get COVID. Don't worry. It's through the screen, guys. You're fine. And you're vaccinated. Don't worry about it. Um, Umar and Omega Madoff, ranked number 10. That last name, though. I think that might buy him a little. That'll get you closer. I'll get you closer. <laughs> get you closer. <laughs> I, it bloody will, though, isn't it? If your last name's Smith, it's going to get you further away. But No, no. But if you're like the cousin of Anthony Smith, you know, and you look just like you, you got, what is it? You got tattooed on your hands? Yeah. Love and peace? No. Fear none. Well, there it is. Well, what is it? Love and hate, you know? No. I think it'll do you a favor. Like, I, I fully expect if Callum or Lucas was to fight, I would fully expect my position in the UFC to help out a little bit. It fucking better. It fucking better. <laughs> Someone you know better I mean? get something out of this shit. Like, fucking <laughs> fast track him to the content of the series. Right. The easiest fucking fight ever. I don't expect... <laughs> Bad fights, do you know what right. I mean? If it's my right. son, I expect a, fucking, <laughs> a little fucking leg up. You know what I That's mean? Fair. That's so if fair. If your name is Umar Namagamadov and you were coached and trained and you are the cousin of the great Habib Namagamadov, again, it's just natural. And Habib is one of the biggest stars the sport's ever seen. Mm -hmm. It just it just makes sense. It does. it does. That's just how it fucking works. Right. We haven't even started. We are 40 minutes into the show. I well, hope you're enjoying yourself. Subscribe and ring the bell if you haven't done so. We always leave that for the end. Don't be a prick. You're watching, just hit subscribe. Yeah, just click it. Just tell them, don't be pricks. Don't be pricks and click the damn button. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Yeah. Um, should we do a non-MMA or should we get straight into Benoit Sandini? We'll do that. Sandini, uh, Dustin Poirier, we've got to talk about that. We cannot disrespect them by going on about some nonsense that Harrington put in the notes. Wow. I was speechless. Saturday night, watching that, Benoit Sondini was the favorite, mm -hmm. which is kind of wild. I mean, it's I understand crazy. it because Dustin got knocked out last time. They go out there, you kind of see why Benoit was the favorite. Five stoppages in his last five. Looked incredible. Bully Poirier, to be honest. Like, mm -hmm. He was bullying him. He was shooting double legs, getting the takedown, getting him in the tie clinch, landing knees, landing elbows. And just, it's like he didn't have any respect for Dustin or the threat that was coming back. And we'll get to the lessons he's going to learn from that in a little bit. But I was watching the fight, just me and Rebecca sitting there, and I'm like, oh, shit, 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 because everybody loves Dustin. you got to mm -hmm. have respect for this guy, the person that he is. But he was taking so much damage. And I remember looking at the clock going, fucking hell, there's still three minutes left. 
You know what I mean? Because I'm yeah. like, no, Dustin looked at the clock twice, and I was like, he's looking at the fucking clock already. I'm not so surprised. first time there was over three minutes you left. Should, you should, for fuck's sake, how long is this? Because I, I just need a minute to compose myself and get my shit together, you know? Um, and anyway, yeah, he had a tough opening round. He was going for the guillotine. I saw yeah, this little that goddamn with guillotine. Fuck. It's his favorite submission. That he never gets. <laughs> <laughs> That's what apparently John Addict said that to him. He's new. DC says it's his favorite submission. And then uh, John Addict says, well, he's never won a fight by a guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> he said on the post show, he was like, I'm going to get someone one of these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What DC probably meant was in the gym, in training, mm-hmm. you go for it all the time. Right. In the gym, what's your favorite submission? Uh, uh Triangles. Yeah, right, you long legged like son of a bitch. Yeah, I'm a triangle guy. I will Kimura the shit out of someone. You like a good Kimura? Oh, I will. I'm a bastard with the Kimura, bro. I'll get you. If I, it depends on how tired. If I'm tired, I'm more of a back take guy because then I just hang out and just make people miserable where I take a break. Kimura's from guard. Kimura's from top. I get that on the hook. I get like that on the top. Yeah, that's oh, standing, the that standing Kimura. Yeah, just rip your fucking arm off. <laughs> All power, no technique. Yeah, no. I'm going to run out of steam if I don't get this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, talking of running out of steam, Benoit Sunday, I don't think it's fair on Dustin Poirier to say that he got tired. He got clipped because Dustin landed that one big uppercut, and I'll yeah, give you the bat on in a minute, kind of dropped him to one knee, showed the threat, showed the power of Dustin. And then in round two, you've got to have respect for the threat coming back. You've got to be offensively minded, but defensively sound at the same time. And when he watches that back, and never mind the staph infection and all that stuff, we'll get to that in a bit. He left his chin kind of sticking out there. He he was he was in a blaze of aggression. He was hyped up. He's like, fucking, I'm landing shots, dush everything. I'm hurting him. I'm taking him down. I'm kneeing him. I'm elbowing him. I'm fucking, oh, viva la France. I'm going to finish your dusty boy, yeah. And you motherfucker cannot stop me. Ah, oh, I fuck you. You fuck me. I fuck you. You motherfucker. You like this? Oh, you want some of this? You son of a bitch? Oh, 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 shit. Oh, you know, shit. Yeah. Merd. <laughs> fucking hell. He, uh, say something intelligent. I'm going to say something. So I don't think I'm, I'm not, I, I, I don't even want to get into the staff infection too much, but. Well, we're going to in I a would, minute. We've got a whole segment on it. I was sitting next to Dean during the fight, right? We're right there. Cage side. We were one minute in to the first round. And during these fights, Dean's got to be on headset and ready to jump in whenever they need him. So he write, we write notes back and forth when we're, you know, like, like we're a little high school girls. And we write notes to each other. He wrote, uh, uh, BDS, gonna get tired. The first, yep. 60 seconds in, that's what I said. BDS, gonna get tired. And I just nodded. Like, he can't fight like that. In a, you can't start like that in a five-round fight. And you cannot fight Dustin Poirier like that. I said it a hundred times on all the, every goddamn pre-show that wanted to put a camera in my face and said, I think Dustin Poirier wins by knockout because Santini is going to come to him. He's going to force the action. He's going to force the pressure. He's going to be in Dustin's face right away. And Dustin is a better striker in those nasty, dirty exchanges because he does a good job of keeping his composure. And I'm so impressed with his vision because he sees everything. The head dips down. He rips Mm -hmm. an uppercut. The guy starts to fade off to his right. He rips the right hook to bring him back and then land the two after they're on their way back. So, his vision right there is is it's too good. If you want to be successful with Dustin Poirier, you'll probably hang back a little bit and force him to play that tit for tat game and play the game of kind of cat and mouse and try to outthink him. But if you get him in the fire, he's going to win that most of the time in just striking exchanges. So as much as I want to give credit to, to whatever he's saying, the reason for his exhaustion was Dean, Dean pointed it out right away. You can't fight like this for five rounds, and you can't fight Dustin Poirier in a phone bo- in a phone booth because he'll probably win. One hundred percent. And even though uh, I'm not ripping on Benoit for coming no. out and saying that he had a staff infection, no, not, me either, because he had one, and he, I, I believe that he was on antibiotics. Me too. But I don't believe that that's why he lost that fight. He if lost that, that happened fight. in the fourth round, and he just Maybe. gassed out of nowhere, I probably would accept it a little bit better, but. But I agree with everything you just said. 
You put that very well. I agree with it 100%. You just, you you got to have a bit of strategy when it comes to somebody like Dusty Poirier. I yeah. think maybe it's like, this guy just got knocked out. I'm going to give him PTSD. I'm going to give him flashbacks. I'm going to finish him. I'm going to do it. He's over 35. The old man curse. It's Volkanovski round two. I'm mm-hmm. going to fucking put it on him from the get-go, get it done. That's the problem when you go out there, by the way, and you've won your last five in a row all by stoppage. Right. Because, because you know, that's why you got to have coaches around you to keep you in check because you start to think, I am this animal. Yeah. And I just got to go full what, what Benoit Saint-Denis. What about after that first exchange, though? And then Dustin's still there. And he's not yeah. shying away from the pressure and his eyes are wide open and you're kind of gritting and biting on your mouthpiece and throwing as hard as you can. And he fucking takes it and then hits you even harder back. I couldn't believe that's, it. That's that's when you start like, oh fuck. And then I'm sure he had a moment where he was like, That's why he's where he is. But this like, guy I cannot finish him. <laughs> he's still here. He's still here. But and he, you guy. can't overwhelm Dustin Poirier. That's one of the most impressive things I think about him. He, like he doesn't panic ever. It, it's insane to watch. What, what what did Ivan Drago say about Rocky? What did he say? What did he say? It was an iconic line. This guy's not real. What if he, he dies, say? he dies. Oh, he's made no. of iron. Yes, this guy's made of iron. He, or something <laughs> like that. Anyway, um, when he landed that knockout, that right hand, what a moment. What a moment. And Dana White said it perfectly himself. That's the kind of shit that makes you a legend. And it mm-hmm. does. To take on Benoit Sondini in the first place when he was ranked 12, didn't need to do it, but wanted to protect and earn his spot. Um, to get his ass kicked like that, but then yeah. to turn it around and get the knockout, that makes it even more epic. And as mm-hmm. fighters, you want that. Like for me, one of my most memorable ones was Anderson Silva because of that knee in the third round and I'm leaking right. blood everywhere, but then to go on and it still be a war. People remember that shit. It's even better when you go out in round two and flatline the guy. Do you know what I mean? Man, it was nasty. It was so nasty. And he kind of dropped him to a knee with that left hand. And then Dustin hits this really pretty, like, fading away right hook. I highlighted it on the pre-show, and it was even even better in person right there sitting in I And I was just just happy for that guy. Just happy for him. There's a clip on Twitter where he gets shot and the blood that shoots out of Benoit's nose. It's nasty. Of course, uh, it didn't take Conor McGregor long to come up and say something about two French people. And he it seemed nice. No, no, he wasn't. He was talking shit. He was calling Dustin Poirier French as well because he's got a French last name and he's from New Orleans. Right, so there's a big like... French influence there. Mm-hmm. And he tagged the French president. He said, not a bad fight by those two Frenchmen or something like that. And oh, I thought Dustin... he was being nice. Well, it was a backhanded compliment. I was like, well, well, that was nice of him to kind of... Nah, nah, he was chatting shit. Where is it? Where is that? Uh, Great fight out of them French boys tonight. (laughs) Two nose felicitations. And then he he tags Emmanuel Macron. Uh, And when he was asked about it at the post fight, uh, Dustin, cool as a cucumber. Oh, yeah? Well, kind of felt that right hand as well. That was it. (laughs) That's all he said. And he did. He did. That's fair. He put him to sleep. Um, So, next fight for Dustin Poirier, because he's still there. He's still in the mix. He's right. You know what it is. You know what it is. Don't don't steal my fucking shit. I'm not. You already know. (laughs) You already know. We know. know, Well, well, I don't know. I just want to make that 100% clear. This is not me as a Michael Bisping ambassador saying this. I'm just saying it all lines up perfectly. Dustin Poirier. The Diamond versus Islam Makachev. I think with that performance, he leapfrogs everybody. Because we always say, let's see how these things, you know, Dana says it all the time. Let's see how everything plays out. And a fight like that will cause you to leapfrog because the public demand, number one, he deserves it. He's been around forever. Mm -hmm. He's a former interim champion. He's not getting any younger. He's always craved being champion of the world. And I think taking on that opponent, beating him the way that he did, given the fact that Charles Oliver and 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 uh, Sarukian, they're not fighting to the end of April. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a bit of a turnaround. Gaethje's fighting Holloway, same Gaethje's time. Gaethje's fighting Max Holloway. Was, God, that, that's the one thing that throws me off. 
Is he Gagey? Is Gagey. Gagey getting skipped. Forget it. Forget it. Forget about Gagey. He took on a guy at 145 pounds. I'm sorry. Forget it. It's got nothing to do with him saying that I'm a biased commentator. <laughs> I actually do mean that. It's got nothing to do with that. I'm just saying timing-wise, timing's everything. He just mm-hmm. got that massive fight there. They could probably do it in June, I think. Uh, who, who said that? I saw it. Oh, no. It was Dustin today on Twitter. Yeah. He said, and me versus Islam. And that's when Islam wants to fight is in June. Yeah, yeah, Ali Abdelaziz actually came out and said, if Dustin is open to it after that performance, Islam would fight him in June if UFC is okay with it. Wow. That's it. What a story. Yeah, that's crazy. That's Unbelievable. Crazy. And don't get me wrong, if Gagey, because Gagey is there. Of course, mm-hmm. he, he just knocked out Dustin. But so Dustin didn't have a bad performance either, though. Like if you go back yeah. and watch the fight, it was a great fight, and he got and he got and he got clipped, and Justin yeah. Gaethje landed a great shot, and Dustin. But there'll still out. be there'll, there'll still be a belt to fight for for Justin Gaethje, regardless of whoever wins. Mm-hmm. There'll yeah. still be a belt to fight for for the winner of Oliveira and Saul Ruki. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? They're just getting a shot now. It doesn't mean right. you're not going to get a title fight. It just means right now is perennially one of the top five, one of the most exciting fighters in all of the sport. Mm-hmm. And after that, the man deserves it. Dustin Poirier, come on. Get on the bloody BYM pod. Listen to how <laughs> we go. are waxing and shining your shoes, bro. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> least he can do is give us a bloody appearance. Yeah, give us a 10-minute interview. He said he would. Reach out to him, Anthony. I'm going to. I've reached out. I'm, get, I'm getting some hot sauce. I, I ran into his marketing manager. In Miami, they're getting me some hot sauce. And I'll say, and let me get 10 minutes on the BYM. Yeah, well, we're going to need and we'll, and we'll keep him for 30. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, no. That's, a, that's my classic. Just a quick 10, 15 minutes. By the way, today's co-host, everybody, is Paul Felder. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's like texting me because he doesn't want to be a dick on the show. Bro, I got to go. You said 10 minutes. Oh, dear. Well done, Dustin Poirier. Um, <laughs> shall we talk? Well, well, we'll have a little break. We've done an hour of MMA. We've got lots of other talking points. All right, today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp, and I'm glad that they've come on board because, listen, you need BetterHelp. If you've thought about starting therapy, if you've thought about tackling your own personal issues, whatever they may be, right, now is the time to start. Stop talking about it. Stop thinking about it and take some action. Right, A lot of people, they still feel like there's some kind of stigma attached to it. If you've got an addiction issue, an anger issue, anxiety, right, alcohol abuse, whatever it may be, speaking to somebody, trust issues, whatever it is, right? Speaking to a licensed professional will help. And this is designed to be the most convenient and flexible way because it's all suited to your schedule. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give it a try. Give BetterHelp a try. You just fill out a brief questionnaire. You'll be matched with a licensed professional therapist. And then by the way, you can switch therapists at no time if you guys aren't jelly. Don't have to drive to the other side of the, the, the town. You haven't got to find a parking space. It's all done at your convenience. And this really is the most convenient and effective way because we're going to save you some money as well. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit betterhelp.com slash believe today and get 10% off your first month. Betterhelp.com slash believe, right? I said this before. If you don't do it for yourself, do it for your loved ones. Do it for your children. Do it for your wife or your husband, whatever it is, right? Your issues tend to start issues for other people. So it's not just you suffering. So if you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for the people that you love. Visit betterhelp.com slash belief for 10% off your first month. Um, Harrington, how yes, sir. You, sir. I'm doing Tell great. Excellent. Anthony, weekend. what his kids will not be able to drink if they move to Denver in school. If, uh, would well, not be able to drink in school if they move to Denver. Right. Uh, you, you, you might want to stay out if you're a big fan of sugary drinks. Uh, they are eliminating juices and sodas. Uh, from you know uh, schools uh, across Denver, they are they're they're talking about expanding it even further into the city. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a milk and water only thing uh, for anyone under the age of eighteen years old in schools in Denver. Now I so I, lame, really. Yeah, I mean you want a good you want a decent Gatorade every once in a while. 
Well, I, I, that's not technically a juice, so maybe you could get that. But I saw this on the news this morning, and I thought this would be an interesting discussion. On the news, they were going against it, saying this is bullshit, this is bullshit, this is ridiculous. I feel the opposite way. I think this is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it would encourage some good discussion. I thought, and Rebecca says, oh, Brian will have something to say about it. And then when I logged I in, Brian, Brian was like, Oh, this is this is government control and all the rest of it. But Harrington had pulled up the wrong story, and it, they're they're, a, they're proposing to ban sodas and juices in restaurants as well for children. I feel like that is definitely a step too far. You right. can't tell your parents how to look after their children. However, at school, at a school, at a place of learning and a place of discipline and a place of where children should do as they are told. A soda is a treat, but number one, then let's not even talk about the unhealthy calorie heavy drink that it is, the bad habits that they're going to form. It's going to get them high as hell on sugar. If it's Coca-Cola, they're going to have a caffeine rush. They're going to have a sugar rush, right? Then they're going to have a crash. There's tons of bloody uh, health side effects to go with it as well, mm -hmm. but that's a treat. And if a school decides to not give the, Kids shouldn't be fucking drinking soda is what I'm getting to for all the no, those reasons. Uh, yeah, my kids don't drink soda at all. They don't. And well, we limit the juice for the most part just because it is so sugary. But like, yeah, my kids aren't drinking any any sodas. That's just not a thing. But they, they drink a little soda. Do what? No, my kids like Lucas. If you, if we go out for a meal, we'll allow well, them to have a spot. Well, yeah, it's so the, the mine, can, mine can have a Sprite like at a restaurant or something like that, but they're not drinking Mountain Dews and Coca-Colas or any of that bullshit at all. But I, I guess I probably side with Brian a little bit here. I just don't like, like, I'll tell my kids you don't get any goddamn sodas, but I don't want anybody else to tell them that. I think that's yeah, but but, but a school is a place of discipline, though. You know, they can make up whatever rules to a certain degree within these four walls. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there could be more walls than four, but you understand what I'm saying? Within these four walls, these are our rules. Like I, th I went to a high school in the UK. We had to wear uniforms. You gotta have your blazer on at all times. You gotta have your shirt tucked in, and you gotta behave a certain way. You gotta be politeful. You gotta be respectful. Okay, and we're gonna offer healthy, balanced food. And if you don't want to stick to that, fuck off somewhere else. And if you want to drink shitty and get all jacked up on Mountain Dew, <laughs> be a little prick. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, schools can do whatever they want. They're government funded, so the government makes the rules for the school, right? But, like, when the government tells McDonald's that you can't buy a soda for your kid, you're stepping way over the fascism line here, which is, like, uh, government control of private enterprise, which mm. just seems like something that we shouldn't have in this country. There was a war fought about it. Oh, 100%. I'm with you one, uh, totally, Brian. You know, if you yeah. go to a restaurant... And you're paying. Yeah, I, want, I want to buy these pieces of shit some beer. If I want to buy it, you, then you better yeah. goddamn serve it. No, for sure. Exactly. If I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm with you there, Brian. Uh, but just in general, sodas, you know, listen, as I say, I, I'm not going to sit here and preach it, people. I, I, in fact, this morning, I had my bacon, my eggs, my sausage, and I had a little miniature fun size can of Coke Zero. You know what I mean? I like a little sparkle. I like a little, I like a little soda with my breakfast. But it's only a little tiny. You know those little tiny ones. Mm -hmm. It's like it's, I'm a little. Yeah. I'm, I think I drank. A, I think I drank a Coke this morning, taking my kids to school. Full Coke. A full Coke. Yeah, oh yeah. <sighs> You're crazy. Twelve ounce, twelve ounce can. Oh, full yeah, fat. Yeah. Full. Not even diet. Full fat. Oh, it feels not even fucking. Coke Zero. Never. I wouldn't waste my diet. So it's so much worse for you than just regular <laughs> soda. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm just kidding. Anthony Smith is a rebel. Um, but the obesity, and it just, it's good for breaking habits for kids. I think for in sure. schools, I think it's Even if it's, fine. I get it, like, if they're just not, you know, if they're going to drink it at home, at least they, the seven or eight hours they spend in school during the day, they're not. I don't think that's a terrible thing. I don't think it's bad. You know, I mm. think that a lot of these, like, you, you'd be, here's where I get shocked. Taking my, uh, my middle schooler to school, the amount, of kids carrying in Starbucks and drinks from coffee places uh, in the morning is mind blowing to me. And my kids always like, Oh, can I get some coffee? No, you're 12. You know, yeah. goddamn coffee. Then you end up like your dad drinking nine gallons of fucking coffee a day. No, yeah, exactly. Ellie, 
teenage girls, even mm-hmm. boys as well. But I think it's more the girls because you've got nothing but girls. Yes, yeah. Awesome. Ellie was obsessed with Starbucks for uh, about 14 to about mm-hmm. 17. All about the Starbucks, all about the fucking Frappuccinos, all about the drinks that have about eight, 900 calories in them and they don't even realize. And then, of course, the caffeine as well. Mm-hmm. So they're out of the minds on sugar, caffeine, fat. You know right. what I mean? They're going to get fat. People mm-hmm. don't understand how bad those drinks are for you. They are. And that blows me away. So, I mean, we don't got a whole shit ton of kids, I guess, pounding Starbucks and Coca-Colas in school. That's probably not terrible. Well, we pulled up that one article a couple months ago of the Starbucks drink that had like like a half a cup yeah. of sugar in it. Yeah, it was crazy. I remember we had it, that It was a Dunkin' Donuts, I think, weren't it? Yeah. Fair enough. Dunkin my bad. Yeah. It's okay. Same shit. They're all the same. Big evil corporations mm-hmm. trying to take over it all. Fattening their kids. Jesus Christ. I want to poison my kids, okay? Just let the school <laughs> do it. Little fox. Uh, all right. What did we think? What did you think about the debut of one Michael Venom Page? I thought. Oh, we're about to lose him. What do you, oh, lose okay. who? The UK fan base. <laughs> no, no, I liked it. I liked it. The only thing he didn't do was get the finish, but I'm I, I'm all on board. The hype train is still choo choo. I'm at the front. I'm wearing a hat. I've got. I'm, uh, I'm a. Well, I'm going to be the conductor and I'm going to slow you down a little bit. Say, hold You're not selling tickets, are you? I'm not buying yet. I'm not buying yet. I'm not saying I'm. I'm not saying he doesn't have it. I'm saying I didn't see it. <laughs> Try and slow it down. I, he's not a young man, number one. I've seen some bad decision making. I've seen a Kevin Holland who, who I don't know, maybe didn't take it, wasn't as focused as he's been at other times. More focused than he has been at sometimes, but uh, to be fair, but I I have nothing about it. It was crazy fast. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) I've just been dying to do that. I'm like, I'm 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 trying to keep this thing going. I'm like, just fucking say one good thing. Say one good thing. (laughs) (laughs) We're fucking going. (laughs) He's he's crazy fast. He's he's really dynamic. But he's very limited. He's very limited in what he can do. I think that he was able to get back to his feet because of a mistake that Kevin Holland made rushing. Not necessarily sure that defensively, I think he made. I don't I don't know that defensively on the ground he did anything. He was right in front of me the whole time. And I'm waiting for him to frame correctly. I'm I, okay, you're getting your back to the fence. That's good. Or you gotta pull, you gotta tuck that bottom foot. You gotta get your hip to the wall. And he's not doing any of it. Kevin just rushed trying to get a finish. And he was able to explode as an athlete and get to his feet. But I had 10 people in my head that would smoke him because of the few problems that I seen. And I maybe not smoke him, but I believe that it would be favored over him. Um, I think he was an incredible, he's an incredible interview. I watched this stuff all week long. I thought that he does an incredible job uh, just being a professional and the way that he speaks, the way that he, he promotes himself. Um, I, he just seemed very limited, seemed very limited. There's not a lot of jabs. There's not a lot of like setups. I mean, how many, I just kept flashing. Like how many people can I imagine in my head that are going to just blast you on your way in? Kevin Hall is not that guy. He, he needs to be match made very carefully. If you want so, him to continue to win. All right. And I, I shall give my opinion, but, but got to remember, we just said before, it's hard to have a perfect performance. You know what I'm saying? It is. And, and I understand. But I think with his style, you have to have a per- perfect performance every single time. I understand some of the points you are making, but I think the brilliance that he has allows him to make those mistakes and still get away with it. You're absolutely right, but you've got to look at the positives first. Kevin Holland, never been knocked out, and he mm-hmm. was almost knocked out multiple times on Saturday some night. Big shots. Kevin Holland has beaten some world-class opposition, okay? I went to a split decision with Jack Della Maddalena, split. Before mm-hmm. that, two wins, Chiesa, Santiago, Ponzinibbio. Went five rounds with Stephen Wonderboy Thompson with a broken hand in a pretty close fight. Before that, Hamza Chimian. Right, so he's been in there with the absolute best. Saturday night, he couldn't get, and, and I'm a big fan of Kevin Holland, so I don't enjoy saying these words, but I think it's true to say, fair to say, he couldn't really get anything going. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and the problem, 
uh, that Venom Page was giving him was getting him more and more frustrated throughout the fight. So it was compounding the deficiencies that Kevin had because he was getting more and more desperate and more and more frustrated throughout the fights where he just he was just swinging recklessly, hoping to land something. And Paige was just not there to be hit. I mean, come on, bro. When, when's the last time you saw somebody fucking coming in and landing those elbows like that yeah. three times? Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, he made a few mistakes, but I, I, I thought he dominated in a very entertaining way. But, but I think that's I think that's that's Kevin Holland's fault. I don't know that that's an MVP thing because how many times did he dart in and miss the right hand and they end up in a clinch? Kevin Holland's has spent he spent his entire career folk, like in the wrestling room working on it defensively, and then when it comes time to be offensive, he doesn't have an answer because that's just not his style. I just kept imagining like, you mean to tell me that Hamza, if he was in that weight class still, if oh. Because everyone's talking about him like he's a world beater because of what he was able to do in, in Bellator. So I'm not, I'm not putting this on him. He's putting this on him, and the people supporting him are putting this on him. Mm-hmm. I kept imagining, like, you, don't, you mean to tell me you don't think Hamzat can duck and cover for one and get a hold of him and drag him down after that? And then what I seen on the ground wasn't high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yep. So I'm not trying to say that I'm – no. I, I, it sounds like I'm hating on him. No, I'm no, no, no. countering what I I'm hearing it. from him. And, and the people that are supporting him saying, oh, this is the next guy. He could go in and beat Leon this Edwards. Maybe he could beat Leon Edwards with that style. It's actually possible. I think that'd well, be a really interesting Leon fight. Would be a fun matchup. Him and right. Hamza, for example, would be I don't be know, a, that, a, I don't know that he... I, there's, a, there's, yeah. a, there's a handful of guys that I think prevent him from ever getting to Leon. That's, that's So I I'm said... Doing. I said to Rebecca Saturday night because she was like, she was like, well, what's Kevin Holland doing wrong? I said, well, there's a lot of things going on wrong. <laughs> Kevin Holland, uh, whilst having a black belt on the ground, did make some mistakes, but he's not got very good wrestling, mm-hmm. right? He's effective on the feet, but he, he wasn't using the correct choices to, to be effective. And when he was trying to take down, he was just walking into an over-under clinch. You mm-hmm. know, Anthony, people that can't wrestle too well, that's the kind of situation they'll end up in. And then they're trying yeah. to drop down, trying to level change from there and get the legs and stuff. Really hard to do because then you just got two guys against the fence fighting in an over under and they're just pummeling all fucking yep. day long. Then the referee steps in break and then you're back. And then the they're break. gassed. <laughs> yeah. But what you got to do is you got to hear, you got to land some good shot, pump on, level change, shoot in, probably snag those legs up, pick him the fuck up. Just like I did against Brian Stan. If you don't think I know what I'm talking about, watch the clinic. Um, that's the, but that's the way to do it, and that's mm-hmm. what some wrestlers would do. Um, but you still got to give the man his moment. Oh, for sure. I I was impressed, like with the the just the diversity of his attack, the way that he moves. And again, I, I'm not saying he's old. Not too many 37 year old men moving like that at that kind of speed and accuracy. So, yeah. but just I was in awe of watching him work. But also as an analyst, I have to be honest and think about. Well, how would this person do? Or where would this guy go? Or what kind of style is he going to struggle with? And that's how that's why this game, this is why my mindset's so fucked in this game sometimes. Because sometimes I can't just watch it and enjoy it. I'm analyzing it the entire time I'm watching it. So again, no, I, I completely agree. I thought I, it's a great win. It's a really tough fight for your first fight in the UFC. I get that. Kel, Kevin Holland is pretty awkward and unconventional himself. So I think you had two kind of awkward styles in there. And it just I don't think it was what everyone expected. Yeah, yeah, it seemed to, I understand it seemed what to you're suck saying. the air out of the room a little bit, if I'm being honest. Did it really? Because I wasn't there. But it sucked the I understand energy what you're saying. Bit. When you look at, for example, in the main event, you've got O'Malley, and it's like orthodox and fast mm-hmm. and Chris. That was unorthodox from both people, certainly from right. Paige, because he has the Taekwondo style and the hands low. And then from Kevin Holland, who is not, he's effective, but he's not exactly the most polished and crisp and concise, right. you know? Mm-hmm. In terms of next matchup for Michael Page, I've got one name that springs to mind. A lot of people are going, oh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Page came out and said he doesn't want that fight, not out of disrespect or fear or anything like that. He just doesn't think it would make for a good matchup just because they got both got the same style. He said two positives equals a negative. I understand mm-hmm. that. They're both going to look to counter right, and yeah, shit. Yeah, right. Yeah. The matchup is simple. It's there. And this might be a little bit on the Michael Venom Page bandwagon. Let me know if he deserves this or not. But okay. you want to? You you got a guy out there that's talking a lot of shit. Okay. You got a guy that's hyping himself up. You got a guy that's tall. You got a guy that's long. You got a guy that fancies himself as a good striker. 
get a guy by the name of Ian Machado Gary. So Machado Gary, Michael Brennan Page in there, right? What, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Why would you do Ian Gary like that? What do you mean? Throw him in. I want to see that. Oh, MVP would beat the shit out of Ian Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> Because the thing that kept Kevin Holland in there is number one is he's got a great chin, but yeah. two, he's just awkward and just kind of funky enough in his own right to yeah. kind of get himself out of the way because he doesn't <laughs> follow the rules. <clears throat> Ian Gary's been, been hurt before on his feet. He's not insanely fast. He's not a great wrestler. And I just, I just think he gets fucking tattooed for as long as he's upright. <laughs> Well, I say that because Ian Gary, and that's kind of with all respect to Ian Gary. With all oh, respect to Ian Gary, I think it's a bad matchup. All you got to do is say with all respect. With all, and you can, I, I think he's got a great game. I think it matches up absolutely anybody. fucking terrible with MVP, though. Yeah, but you can you can just insult anybody to your oh, heart's well, content he, as well, long he as you like, finish he your sentence. Like, he doesn't like me, anyways. I don't think he likes me either. Then you can you, all you gotta do is finish the sentence. We've been no, real nice to that no, guy. No, no disrespect. Time. Oh no, I know. No, I know. He really... I had an interview with him and he fucking cancelled on me. They had yeah. the, the interview. I was like, all right. Well, we yeah, got the Kevin. same we got the same manager, and they said, Yeah, he just uh you canceled on you on Bisbing and didn't want to because of something. And I was like, What did Bisbing do? Like, well, apparently you guys weren't very nice to him on the pocket. Oh, you mean we were fucking honest? Yeah, I guess that would hurt your feelings. I have never been insulting. I've never insulted him. I don't. I've think never so. insulted a fighter. I don't think I've, I've given a fair say. I, I might. I sometimes might. We have a laugh and we get a little bit silly, but I'm, we do. I don't think we're, we're insulting to, any. We're fighters. not trying to hurt anyone's feelings. We're just talking about sometimes, what we see. And maybe you don't like that all the time. Mike has said lots of shit about me that I don't like when when he's when he's oh. doing his job. I don't hold it against him though. Oh, for crying out loud! Don't make me feel bad. I don't. I'm not. I don't feel bad. You I'm are. Fine. I'm not, I mean, I, I don't feel bad. Why would you feel bad? You're making me feel bad. Well, I can't make you do anything. You don't give me that power over you. Okay. That's well said. <laughs> good. Just don't worry about it. Uh, where were we? So anyway, Michael Vernon Page, Ian Gary, sign him up. Or who would you book it with? What would your next five be? Uh, who's in the top 10? Because well, I don't well, have Mike, it right in front was, of me. Let me was, see. Uh, I thought you had it in front Atlanta. of me. Jack Della Madalena had a good win on Saturday over yeah. Gilbert Burns. Maybe. Could it be Jack? But he called out Shavcat, right? Manoff. That's a great call out. Nobody bloody calls out Shavcat. Nobody calls him out. All right. I'm going to pull him up right Jack here. That's Jack Della Madalena for that. He need, that is he, a that, they need to start out. giving him four corners instead of one, just so one guy can carry his large nuts. <laughs> he needs a wheelbarrow <laughs> yeah. for his nutsack. All right. So uh, got, what are you looking at? The rankings? Yeah, I'm looking at the rankings. Jack is 11 right now. Yeah. Um, it's, I like the Gary call out, actually. I, are, yeah, I, that's I, what I'm I, saying. Yeah, right? I think I like that. I like that. And they had a little bit of a Ian Gary dismissed. Or like a it. Jeff Neal. Might be fun. Jeff Neal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gilbert Burns sadly did not get the job done on Saturday. We love Gilbert yeah. Burns. I tell you what, you got to love Jack Della Madalena just as much. All class. Both guys brought it. Jack Della Madalena always with the boxing. Gilbert Burns, we knew the threat from the wrestling would be a real thing, and it was a real thing. Came close to a couple of submissions, took the bite, landed some good shots on the feet. Trending to lose the fight according to the scorecards. Mm -hmm. And then in a crazy scramble, Jack had the uh, Biggest sense of urgency. Got to his feet quicker. Need him in the face. Dropped him. Finished him. Fantastic. Yeah, there's not a lot more to add to that. I thought Gilbert looked really good. He looked a little bit mm, out of sorts kind of during the fight, though. He looked uncomfortable um, kind of the whole time, which makes a lot of sense because uh, Jack Della Maddalena is an absolute monster. But he, he looked a little frazzled the whole time. Um yeah, and Jack did a great job. He he was able to escape at the towards the end of the third round, turned and burned, and that was all she wrote. Felt so yeah. you got to feel for Gilbert though. You do. I, I love Gilbert Burns. He's so nice. He came mm -hmm. on the show a couple of weeks ago. Even when he was on the on the ground, 
and he, he sat there and he smiled. He's like, okay, all right. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was like just a realization I've lost the fight. The referee made the right call. Oh, God. Yes, yeah, it's hard. And I, I like Jack, so good for him. You know. Oh, yeah, no, for sure. But it's like Rebecca was like, oh, my God, he's so sweet. Look at him. Oh, he's smiling. He seems like such a nice guy. I'm like, he's married, babe. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're supposed uh, to say no. you're married, babe. Yeah, so shut yeah, the yeah. Fuck yeah. Up. <laughs> Where are the notes from Harrington? I don't see them. Um, all right. So obviously, Pioria got back to winning ways. Fantastic. That was a great mm-hmm. performance. Song you don't look too incredible early on. I want to get some of these bigger talking points. Uh, do you want to get? Were you surprised at Song you don't? He took his time. No, I thought I thought that it could go that way. Um, Song always starts really fast, and and Piotr Jan actually surprised me more probably than Song because he, I, I thought if Song started fast and got and got over on him early, that I thought Peter Jan would would have a tough time fighting from behind. Man, that guy fought with a a sense of urgency and a in a passion and kind of a fire in his eyes that I haven't seen in a while. It seems I, yeah. I was afraid that maybe he had lost that and that maybe we're kind of seeing the the demise of Peter Jan. But uh, he still got it. That, that that dog is still in there, and I, I I don't know. I thought his game plan was 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 perfect, and just it, it was really weird though. Not to get too deep into the X's and the O's, but early in the first round, Piotr Jan reacted to every single uh like fainted takedown, every fake shot. Oh, every, he did big. It was so bad. It was so bad. And again, me and Dean are writing notes back and forth. And Dean writes the note and says, uh, you know, Marab PTSD. It's like he's so uh, worried yeah. about being taken yeah. down. But, like, he's got great takedown defense. When he stopped, like, reacting to the feints, he defended all the takedowns. So, like, mm-hmm. I, I, th- I thought he looked great. I thought it was an awesome performance, really gutsy. I think he needed that just mentally and just emotionally to, to battle through and, and overcome some adversity. I thought it was incredible. Yeah. And One of my fair, favorite fights of the night, to be honest with you. I mean, I mean, he lost his three before that, but it was two: Sean O'Malley, yeah, Marat Davalishvili, and uh, Aljamain Sterling. Right. You know what two, I mean? Two split decisions, out and they're all champions, right? Well, Marab's not a champion, but he's probably yeah. going to fight for the belt next. Mm-hmm. You know. So there you go. Oh, also, we're going to talk about this real quick. Just a couple of minutes on it. Curtis Blaze got back to winning ways. Mm-hmm. Took out Jalton Almeida on the prelim headliner. Um, a succession of hammer fists as he was going for the single leg. Hammer fists after hammer fists. Gets the stoppage. Gets the job done. Uh, Jalta Almeida, super impressive in the first round. Picking up Curtis Blades, putting him down like that. The wrestling is phenomenal. But he is kind of a one-trick pony. And mm-hmm. he's a little too reliant on only wrestling. Um, he was doing good, though. Called out Tom Aspinall afterwards. I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I do, too. Um there's consequences in this game. How many times do you think you can pick up 265 pound Curtis Blades and put him back down? I mean, Almeida's a big guy. He's not the largest heavyweight though. So I mean, there's there's some strain there. I'm sure he's strong. I'm sure he's he he, he can lift you know big numbers. But they're crediting him with nine takedowns. In my opinion, mm-hmm. that's one takedown and eight mat returns. But what do I know? Um, but he's just picking him up. Come, DC. I mean, that's fair. I mean, that's how it works. But I know. I to, I mean to pick up to pick him up eight times and put him down. That's a big man, and he in his takedown his his next entry in the second round look way different than the first. I think there's a there's some consequence for for the way you fight. So maybe a little bit of, um, I thought Curtis did a good job of defending better the second in the second round. Just instead of I think he, it seemed like in the first round Curtis let him in like oh I got this you know I can defend this because he looked very relaxed and almost annoyed. And then he was, and then the next thing he knows, he was on the ground. So I think he took him a little more serious in the in the wrestling realm in the second round. But what a crazy finish! Incredible call out, though. I would love to watch that fight. Yeah, it makes all the sense in the world to me. And it's it's funny because typically the guy with the win isn't the one calling the guy out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He's already beaten Tom, but yep. things have changed. Tom's now the interim heavyweight champion of the world. Tom should stay active. He should defend that interim spot. Build the momentum. Build the need for that fight to happen. Of course, a lot of people have kind of shifted and want to see uh, Aspinall versus Jones, but it doesn't matter. That fight's set in place with Stipe. That's going to happen. 
defend against Curtis Blades in the meantime, um, I think that, that, that's, that, that that's the perfect opportunity. Mm-hmm. I say next UFC event in the UK, Leon Edwards versus who's next up at Welterweight. If you don't say Bilal, he's going to freak out. It's Bilal Muhammad. let's be yeah. right. Tom Aspinall, Curtis Blades, Michael Venom Page, Ian Gary. Let's go. That's three good fights, top of the bill. That's good. Matchmaker Mikey B. Who else we got? Mohamed Makaev. Oh, yeah. Versus, versus Brandon Royval. Brandon Royval. Boom. That's four fights on the main card. Who's another UK fighter? Paddy Ooh. Pimbler. Versus, uh, hold Drew on. We just, no, I just match made this in my head over the weekend. Paddy P- Pimblet versus uh, RDA. Javier Dos Anjos. Yes. I don't know about that. It's it's a good fight. I'm it's saying, I'm saying fight. For, for Paddy, it's it, that's a risky one. Yeah. Arnold Allen it's, versus... Oh. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. That's a tougher one. <laughs> um, not a lot of people for him to fight right now. Who did you just mention? So, oh, RDA. We've got to give a shout out to RDA. Who did he fight? Oh, he fighting Mataj Gamrot. Mm-hmm. Oh, it just shows... <clears throat> Los Santos is a goddamn dog, man. Been around he the sport is. forever. Was the champion at lightweight. Almost a champ at welterweight. God knows how many fights he's had. Still going. Almost finishes Mataj Gamrot in round one. You know? <laughs> no. He had him hurt bad. He did. He oh, did. Oh, man. That guy. What a legend. What anyway, an absolute legend. Fair play. Well done to everybody that competed at UFC 299. Incredible event. All right, today's episode is sponsored by Mando. That is Mando's deodorant products. And listen, if you're one of those guys that struggles with BO, if you struggle with sweatiness, if you struggle with a natural odor that is unattractive, then Mando is here to save your day. Mando is clinically proven to control body odor for 72 hours, wherever you stink, pits, package, feet, and beyond. So make the switch to Mando, whole body deodorant, and smell like a zero every day. What am I talking about? Well, if we did a zero to 10 scale with 10 being the worst, okay, what do you smell like? Because in a clinical study, men who showered with soap and used Mando whole body deodorant in their pits had an odor score of zero out of 10 after 12 hours, right? No odor. Men who showered with soap alone had an armpit odor score of eight out of 10. As I say, it keeps going and works for 72 hours. It was created by a doctor who saw firsthand how normal BO was being misdiagnosed mistreated, clinically proven to block all day and control odor for 72 hours. It is baking soda free. It is paraben free. It is pH balanced so it's safe to use below the belt. Clinically proven to control odor better than a shower with soap alone. And by the way, it doesn't just stop BO. It makes you smell nice. It makes you smell fresh and it is 100% natural, organic and fragrance oil free. Dermatologist recommends recommended and we have a fantastic offer for you so give it a try you won't be disappointed so all you got to do is go to shopmando.com use the code bisping and get five dollars off your starter pack that is over 40 percent off shopmando.com use the code bisping for five dollars off your starter pack which is over 40 percent off harrington last week was a big week for combat sports. We had Francis Ngannou, Anthony Joshua, UFC 299, and we also had a bit of action going down in Paris, France, which is uh, the home of uh, Manuel Saint Denis. But um, that uh, what is not his night. But there was uh, another French fighter in the the, the octagon. Yeah, bad French. We we we. They, um, yeah, it's how you say you're having fun. You refer to yourself and some other people. Um, yeah, so Cedric Dumbe, he was in the main event, PFL Paris, a uh, big time spot. In the third round, uh, he looked down at his toe. Uh, he, he was pointing at it, complaining to the referee. Uh, his opponent uh, decided not to engage after seeing that. Uh, and then again, they both looked to the ref. At that point, Goddard stepped in, called the whole thing off. I uh, included in the notes a uh, 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 referee breakdown of exactly why that happened, if you want it. Do we have the video, Brian? The video is doing the rounds on Twitter. I saw it straight away when it happened and didn't watch the event. Uh, Cedric Dumbe is a big deal in Paris. Mm-hmm. Big signing for the PFL, apparently. Uh, former kickboxer, tons of hype around him. Don't know too much about him. 
Here we go. Oh, let's have oh, it's the big John McCarthy. Yeah, what what we have right now, if you're looking, when you see Baki, he does back up. But when you see Cedric Dubai say, I have something wrong with my foot, it is there's nothing that's been done that's illegal. So he's going to have to fight through the injury. It's what we call self-inflicted. And then you see them start to go, and Baki stops like, hey, you're, you're, you don't want to fight. And Cedric again looks at Mark Goddard and points to his foot, illustrating that he has an injury to his foot. Once that's done, Mark Goddard has got to call the fight. The fight is over. It is a technical knockout victory for Baki based upon what we call a self-inflicted injury. Thanks, Brian. Um, so I saw nothing but an outpour of abuse to Mark Goddard regarding that stoppage. He did the correct thing. A referee needs to be assertive. They need to make split-second judgments and take action against it. And at that moment in time, listen, I feel for Cedric Dumbe because, you know, he's, there was something wrong with his toe. They're but saying the it was like a, a splinter from the cage. A shard of glass is a what I saw. shard of glass, yeah. I mean, that sucks. It does. It really sucks. But unfortunately, you could have a shard of a fist in your eyeball. You could have a broken nose. You could have, when the fight starts, I mean, granted, maybe you could have waited between rounds, you know, but if you have to stop, and it is a shame if it was a shard of glass that obviously shouldn't be inside an octagon. I right. don't know how the hell that happened. But if that is the case, it's a massive shame. But still, it doesn't affect that Mark Goddard made the right decision. Because... See, I feel like I, I feel I totally disagree. I felt like he jumped the gun a little bit before finding everything out exactly. And maybe that wouldn't have changed the result. But I think it's his reaction that people are getting angry about. Because he just he jumped in, he stopped it, he seemed a bit aggressive with the stoppage. And so when Cedric was trying to uh like, you know, give his case, Goddard kind of blew him off. Like, nope, nope, fuck that. That's that this is over. And I think if he would have just stopped and said, hey, what's going on? And he said, hey, I got, a pe I got a piece of glass in my foot. It's killing me. Or something, you know, I stepped on something in the octagon. And then Goddard, even if he did have to stop it anyways, maybe seeming seemingly a little more caring, I think it would be less. I, I understand what less. you're saying. I understand. And I'm not going to disregard what you say there at all, because when you put it like that, it's hard to argue with that. However, everything's hindsight in 2020. Right, you know, right, and maybe you know, Goddard thought he just he rolled his ankle or broke a toe or something, and he's complaining about it, so he stops the fight. Yeah, I think it, I think if Goddard could go back and do it again, I bet he would change that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe that doesn't change the result of the fight, and he still has to stop it. But I think the approach and how it's viewed from the outside looking in matters to people. And I, I think I, it appeared like he had he was complaining that he'd hurt his toe. Right. But I don't think Goddard gave him a chance to explain it either. Mm. So I think it would have been I think it would have been much easier to explain that to the crowd and to the onlookers and even to Cedric. And say, look, I get it. This really sucks, but here's the rules, and this is what we have to go by. I have to stop this fight because of you know a, you a self harm or self injury or whatever it is. And I don't think then Cedric probably not going to have this huge freak out either and say, "Fuck you!" Like, all right, that's the rules. That's what it is. I'm sure, he's still going to be upset, but. I don't know. Did I think he sometimes out? he was upset for sure because I don't think he was. He, I don't think he felt heard. That's what it seems like. He didn't feel like he was being listened to, and Goddard was kind of like he seemed a bit aggressive. He seemed a bit aggressive about it. And I like mm -hmm. Mark. I think Mark. I think he does a really good job. Um, and I think that I have done a much better job in the last couple of years of commending good jobs by referees more so than I used to. Saying, "Hey, the, I think this ref did a really good job here. He did a good job here." Uh, but I'll still say when I like it, we probably could have went about that a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, the way you laid out there, it sounds like it would have been a more definitely palatable outcome. Yeah. But I well, guess inter this is entertainment. Like it has to be the way that well, people it, consume it matters. It, it, it is. It is. But it's not entertainment to the referees. The referees and Mark Goddard takes his job extremely seriously. I totally and I think that's maybe why the people coming on board thinking he was, you know, not being sympathetic towards the fighter. But at that moment in time, he's like, a referee's got to call it black and white. This, and and, th and he does. He's mm -hmm. right to the rule book, to the fine letter. Right. You know, he's like, this is the rules. And there's probably no gray area. And I wonder if there is any kind of, and, and uh, Big John McCarthy, another 
but the most experienced MMA referee. He was mm-hmm. refereeing UFC one. Okay. Right. The first ever UFC fight, first ever proper sanctioned MMA fight. We wasn't sanctioned back then, but you get the point. Yeah. And he, he, he's on the side of Mark Goddard as well. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I and I'm not anti Mark. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, I just feel like you, aesthetically. You're Mark. It's fine. No, nah, I love it's, Mark. I just feel like aesthetically, we could have done it. We could have made that a little bit better. We? Yeah. As a community. You don't make those fucking. There ain't no glass in the UFC cages, bro. That's true. <laughs> That's true. How do you get glass in a cage? That's a bigger problem. I have no idea. How do you think? Do you think it was like when it was getting built, put together, constructed? Possibly, or maybe one of the commissioners stepped on a broken pe- bottle, a broken beer bottle ah, somewhere, that's, that's, and, tra- that's and tracked possible. it in. Yeah, but it's it's shitty. It, it is. It is shitty. So oh, I'd be, bur- down- I'd be burning down the building if I didn't get my imagine, show, my imagine, win money. And how was he doing, Harrington? Did you watch the fight? Was Was Doom Bear winning up until that point? Doom Bear, I'll be honest with you. Doom, I I Doom haven't, Bear. but I. I have a graphic up here that has the P, uh, PFL like smart scoring system, so I'll let you know. It's a smart scoring system, so it should have it. Yeah, it's AI generated. We should you know. know. We should know. Um, what bad? What bad podcasters that we didn't watch the first two and a half? <laughs> bro, I can only I can only consume so much. Yeah, I'm. My brain is. I'm. I'll be honest. Two nine nine here. Yeah. Joshua ain't gone with that. PFL, <laughs> it's not there. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not there. I watched the highlights. Uh, so I have it here. It was uh, the, his opponent was up. I'm sorry, uh, Dumbay was up by two strikes total, uh, but his opponent was up four takedowns to none. So uh, uh, likely Dumbay was losing that fight. Yeah. Regardless, regardless. Okay, okay. How many did you have anything else, buddy? Before we get to questions, and thank you all for watching and being here this long. If you are, uh, nothing that's pressing. So, no, that's out of you, my mind. You said when we stop for a break before. I mean, it's, it's not in the show because we edited it out. We mean it until he went for a pee. You listed three subjects. I did. I you didn't. Did. You didn't. Say, so that's you, why I said I only wanted two. Right. Okay. We had the conversation. What was the other one? You, uh, it was uh, UFC 300's bout order. Uh, the both the the final fight on the card being announced, as well as uh, as as the bout order of what's going to be on the main card and what's going to be on the prelims. Uh, as as noted, Cody Garbrandt is going to be the first fight uh, on the card. Uh, added this weekend uh, was Hanato Moicano versus Jalen Turner. Uh, and the big sticking point for a lot of fans is that uh, Bo Nickel will be on the main card against Cody Brundage uh, rather than the prelims. Yeah, and there's a lot of people chatting shit online about that, about Bo Nickel and Cody Brundage being, Brundage being the first fight on the main card. I have no issue with it. So Yuri Prohaska, Alexander Rakic, I'm looking at the wiki page. It's not in order, but from what I remember, that's the prelim headliner. Very, mm-hmm. very relevant fight in the light heavyweight division. Rakic is phenomenal. He's very good. Very uh, Prohaska, good. obviously, the, uh, the former champ, looking to get back on the horse. Then you start off the main card. It'll be Bo Nickel. Oh, no, I believe the first fight is actually Charles Oliveira versus Armin Sarukian. Then it's Cody Brundage mm-hmm. versus Bo Nickel. My and guy. then you've got Gagey Holloway, Zhang Wei Li, and then uh, Pereira and Jamal Hill. I have no issue with that card, sorry, that fight being on the main card. I will explain why, but do you? No, none. None. It's no, intriguing. No. People want to see him. People want to watch Bo. So whether he's got a ranking or not, uh, this is entertainment. The, you give the fans what they want. They want to see him fight. They're interested well, in Bo Nickel. And they're trying to build him. Exactly. That's my point. They're trying to build him. And he's shown phenomenal potential. He's mm-hmm. only 5-0, and oh, but he made his uh, debut on the Contender Series. All wins, all stoppages, all the first round, mm-hmm. all the potential in the world. So they've got a really clean cut, well-spoken, intelligent, American wrestling phenom, okay? They have an American version of Hamza or a, a Habib Namagamadov mm-hmm. that has shown he can strike as well. Why would you not give him a big spotlight? The pop that he got from the crowd in his last fight blew me away. It shows yeah. people are really, really watching. When he knocked out Bal Woodburn, mm-hmm. people are on board. The hype train for Cody, uh, for Bo Nickel. Um, so, yeah, 
you give him the spotlight on the main card at UFC 300, he goes out, hopefully, maybe, I don't know, I'm not saying hopefully, I know he's your boy, yeah. hopefully he gets knocked the fuck out. Anthony. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah! You know, I pulled that one back, didn't I? Yeah, you see if he reeled that one back in. You know, hope, hope, hopefully he loses. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, it's that's called being a promoter. Shut the yeah. hell up. People need to get over it. Get over it. Get over it. Now, what do you think? UFC uh, 300 or UFC 299? What do you mean? Which one's going to be better? What's the better card? I don't know. They're both really good. I know. I don't know. It doesn't matter. UFC 299 was one of the best events ever. Yeah. UFC 300 is phenomenal. I think I'll tell you. I'll tell you after 300 which one was better. Yeah, exactly. But the fact that it's even a conversation in the first place is crazy. Can't wait yeah. for that one. You work in 300. Mm-hmm. I'm working 300. Hell yeah. TNT Sports is working 300. Let's go. We got Power Slap the day of the weigh-ins. Yes. I'm triple dipping. Now I need to Now I need to make sure that I'm the catcher. ESPN, TNT, Slap. It's going to be a busy go. week. It's going to be a busy week. That's why you're rich. I'm gonna. I'm not rich for one. I'm gonna have no voice. I'm overworked. I'm not on the pay. I get paid very well. I'm very happy. No complaints. Uh, Here we go reeling it, reeling it back again. Not reeling it back. <laughs> He's a back reeling son of a bitch. Right. Uh, if you got a question, send it into bynpod at gmail.com. Ladies, and gentlemen, we will play your videos. A lot of people complain and saying I've sent in four questions and it never gets played. I will say this. Brian is the judge, the jury, and the executor, executioner. But he executes whether or not and decides the video is worthy of be, even being presented. So there must be a reason. I show I show you some of the videos that don't make it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On occasion, you'll say, yeah. you, know, you got to check this one out. But after. <laughs> but typically, on the show like this, I say, we got any questions? And he goes, yeah. If you don't make the brain cut... Talk your shit to Brian. At BBK yeah. is right. Get on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Go out they, there. They, they for sure do. No. <laughs> At the um, Harrington as well. Uh, yeah, and if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you find podcasts, make sure to subscribe. Leave us a five-star rating, positive review. It really helps out on those platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the show and hit that notification bell to find out whenever a new episode drops. And if you want to catch over 500 episodes, you can't find anywhere else completely ad-free and totally uncensored, head to gasdigital.com. Use the promo code BYM14 and get a two-week free trial. Check out over 20 great shows on the network. All right, so first question we got here is from Jake Zakowski. Yo, what up, BYM? Jake here from Pennsylvania with another quick question. My question for you guys is, do you think the UFC will ever change their gloves? Um, I know Onyx makes a really nice pair like that doesn't promote the hand opening up. Um, and my other question is, do you guys also think that Perilla looks like uh, Jesse Pinkman? It's hilarious. I've been watching the Embedded, and I can't wait for this weekend. Hell yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Jake. Uh, to answer your question, Brian, pull up a picture of Jason Perillo because he does. He looks just like Jesse Pinkman from Breaking Bad. Speaking of which, Anthony, give me a pro, uh, Breaking Bad progress report, please. Oh, it slowed down a little bit. But uh, we're, we're still chipping away. Not quickly. Uh, but we're still chipping what's, away. What, what season? Don't bullshit me. Um, Season two, I believe. We're chipping away, I think. Got to do better. To I know. Got to do to better. Uh, this is how good it is because Lucas, I, I've said it before many times, it's the only show that he watches. And when he comes in from training, he's having his dinner, and it's about 8.30, so it's kind of getting late, and we go to bed around then. So Rebecca's doing her final things. You know, she's stacking the dishwasher and all that type of stuff, and I'll be like, oh, fuck, I've got to do a YouTube video for the morning. Oh, mm-hmm. Whatever. When I come out... Uh, Lucas is always sat watching Breaking Bad. There we go. That's, oh, oh, it definitely does when you do the side by side. Oh, dear. Oh, that's Brilliant. great. Thanks. Um, and I'm like, Lucas, there's other shows to watch. And at that moment in time, I don't know what season it is, Jesse Pinkman is making a ton of dough. And Saul Goodman, the crooked lawyer, has come in and he sits him down and he's talking about buying the place that where they're sitting in as a money laundering uh, facility 
to wash the money. And then he listens to the whole pitch and Jesse just goes, so you want me to buy a nail salon so I can start paying taxes? I'm a fucking criminal, yo. <laughs> <laughs> and I started laughing and Lucas is like, see, best show ever, dad. <laughs> and it is. Anthony, come on, pick it up. What was the question? The gloves. The, the gloves. The gloves. Um, I don't know that they'll ever change it. I know that Trevor Whitman and them have had conversations about um, using his gloves, but I don't know where those went or why it died. I've, I think I've, I've heard some rumors, but um, I have no idea what the UFC is planning for their equipment. I think the I ones think, that we got now are okay. I think it could do with being a bit improved. I think mm-hmm. it's worth looking at. Obviously, eye pokes are a very prevalent injury. Yeah. Almost every fight night, there's somebody gets poked in the eye. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and sometimes big high profile fights have stopped because of them. So I, th- I think there's a solution. You know, I've always said I feel like there should be a, a mechanism that forces the fingers to bend. Mm-hmm. So you got to use the strength to straighten the fingers to clasp. Yeah. You know, I agree. I, yeah. They could be better. I just don't I just don't know that I don't know that that'll happen. At some point in time, they will. I just don't know when. Uh, anyway, Brian, what else do we have, buddy? All right, next question we have here is from uh, Mr. Rupen. I'm not sure if that's how you say that or not. Hey, BYM crew, long-time listener and supporter here. Love you guys. It's the number one Armin Sarukian fan here, and I was watching my boy at the UFC 300 Q&A and just getting so mad at the fans, asking dumb and disrespectful questions over and over. Um, So my question is, what do you think the UFC can do to improve fan interaction? Maybe those Q&As, I'm not sure. But and also, have you guys ever had any close calls or scuffles, or have you interacted with disrespectful fans in your careers? Thank you very much. Love you guys. Peace. Thank you for the question because I'm glad you brought that up. Did you see that, Anthony? I didn't. No, I didn't know what so, he was talking about. Yeah. So obviously, they do the guest fighters before the weigh-ins, mm-hmm. and then people can come up and ask questions. Yeah. And there was about three or four guys. And they came up and, look, listen, it's one thing to have your favorite fighter. Maybe you don't like this guy, you know, and you might be a little bit close to the edge. But they were just, I forget what they said now, but it was really bad. They were very, very insulting. You're going to get knocked the fuck out. Fuck you, Armin, and all this type of stuff. And Armin just sat there and took it all. But it was so disrespectful. The fact that he's mm-hmm. gone all that gone there, he's sitting there on stage, he steps foot in the octagon, you wouldn't say that to his goddamn face, no. you know what I mean? Have a little bit of respect. It was it was, a, it was disgusting, to be honest. Well, yeah, that's <clears throat> that's terrible. I, I've, I've never had any experiences, nothing like that, uh, ever. Of course, we've all been booed or cheered and, mm. or whatever when we're walking out and you're in the octagon, but like never any one-on-one interaction like that ever. What about in public? You ever had a negative? No. No, From but I'd have, I'd, I'd have came off that fucking stage. I'd have walked right down there and said, no, 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 no. We're going to have a conversation. Let's talk. Yeah, about yeah. I, uh, the UFC, I mean, it's not, they can't police every individual on what they're going to say when they get on the microphone. Right. You you would imagine that the average fan has decency and has respect for what they do. Because mm-hmm. unfortunately, the world, there's a few assholes here and there. I think for the most part, most people are good people and there to enjoy the fights in the spirit of the occasion. So I don't think they need to set any kind of rules, but I think if anyone wants to go up and speak like that, they should get fucking thrown out. Throw them out. Yeah, take, get them out of there for sure. Get them out I of agree there, with that. Sure. I agree with that. Definitely throw yeah, them out of yeah. the, the Q&A. What are you doing? These are stars. These, these are guests, our guests. Right. They're here for you. We shouldn't have to tell you to be respectful. You right. know? Um, yeah, I haven't had this. I'm trying to think of a similar situation. I just remember, what was it? What was it? I, I always remember this. It was years ago when I was coaching the Ultimate Fight. I was in Las Vegas. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning outside, outside like a Ralph's. Then just a car drove by and they wound down the window. Fuck you, Bisping. <laughs> <laughs> and then just drove off. I was like, come no. on. Hell it was one yeah. of my first times getting recognized. You know what oh, I mean? I was like, funny. oh, yeah. yeah I don't give yeah. a fuck. He they knew who me. I was. Yeah, they know me. Yeah, that's why people know me, guys. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm famous. You know, just Bis- just old famous Bisping over here, you know. Just- I'm not quite sure how to put this, but I'm kind of a big deal. You are. My apartment yes. smells of leather-bound books. Oh, no, my apartment smells of rich mahogany and yeah, reeks yeah, yeah. of leather-bound books. Yeah. 
You, what was the that movie? A quote? Is that a quote? What's the movie? I don't know. I'll give you another clue. So what cologne we're going for today? Oh, for this one, I'm pulling out the big guns. They call it Sex Panther because it's made of real bits of panther. <laughs> you what know, the that? studies, 60% of the time, it works every time. What is that? Oh, my God. Veronica Corning star. <laughs> Dorothy Mantooth is a saint. It's so hot. <laughs> Milk was a bad choice. What is that? It's, don't it's, say it, Brian. I have. I don't know. Sky rockets at night. After I don't think I know the movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, Brian, do you have another quote to tease Anthony with? Because I'm running out. I love lamp. I love lamp. Do you really love lamp, Brian? Hand <laughs> them things in here and say you love them. What is it? Anchorman. I've never seen Anchorman. Oh God, you've never seen it? No, never. I watched it Friday night. We ever had to end the show with another movie I didn't fucking <laughs> know. <laughs> I watched it first because like I've been showing Lucas like um, you know like classic eighties and nineties action movies. We've done the Commando. We've done like the Schwarzeneggers. We've done the Van Dams. And now we did we did Equilibrium last week. That's a good mm-hmm. one. Christian Bale. We've done like the Dark Knight. We've did Big Trouble in Little China. That like all kind of genre. Then now we've gone into the comedies, and I'm like, oh my god, we've just opened the door. There's right. so many more films. We did Anchorman; he loved it. So yesterday we did Happy Gilmore. Have you seen that one? That's a great movie. That's a good. That's a, he loved it as well. So I don't know what we're talking about, but should we end the show? Or do, oh, oh we got one more, Brian. We sure do. And this is from uh, an old friend, Dallas Bowling. What's going on, guys? Dallas from Staten Island. I know it's been a while since you heard from me. I'm still here, still listening, still tuning into every episode. Still a huge fan of all you guys. You know I got love for Mike, Brian, Harrington, Anthony. He probably doesn't know who I am, but I'm still tuning in. It's about 6.50. I'm rushing home Saturday night, trying to get home for some of these prelims. Because, you know, I got to be watching the UFC 299 raining out here. Now, I just finished the latest episode. Harrington, you have a time machine. You can go back to any time you want. But yeah, let's go back to 2023 March and buy Bitcoin for $25,000. Sure, you'll make some money because it's whatever it's worth right now. Why not go back to March 2011 and pay 86 cents? I said I wasn't going to do this again. I wasn't going to say it. I wasn't going to say it. But fuck Harrington. That's right, I said it. Fuck Harrington. Nothing but love for you guys. Enjoy the fights. And hey, if you go back to March 2011, we'll probably be sitting next to Dana White right now, me and you, Harrington, because we'll be that fucking filthy rich. Or whatever. Shout out to Lewis, the baby boy, always. <laughs> he just could do his own podcast. We just sit here and do nothing. I, I just figured I'd put him on to yell at Harrington. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Was that Thursday's episode when Anthony was on? I want to give it. Yes. So sir. Harrington was asked if he had a time machine. And mm-hmm. I'll throw the same question to you, and this is how we'll finish the show. He was asked if he had a time machine, what era would he go back to? And he's, I think he said, I'll go back to 2023 and buy Bitcoin at 28 grand. A guy bought a Bitcoin. I did the math on this because mm-hmm. Bitcoin's at 70,000 now. Jeez. A guy bought a, a, a pizza for 30,000 Bitcoin in t- years ago when he first yeah. was yeah, able yeah. to buy something. In today's money, he spent $2.1 billion on a pizza. Oh, that's insane. I know. That's crazy. If you had a time machine, Anthony, any period of civilization, and the time machine it allows global travel at the speed of light as well. I, I don't know that this is my real answer, but this is definitely one of the times I would go back to, and people are going to hate me for this. I was just saying the other day, I kind of miss the COVID pandemic. <laughs> of all the answers, of all the time periods. Yeah, I'm thinking, because I said Vic, uh, Rebecca wants to go back to the Victorian days. I'm sure some people say, I, w- I want to be around as a caveman and the dinosaurs and stuff like that. You pick, I thought you were going to say ancient Japan. No. High times. No, no. No, the I, Wild West. A real yeah, life Clint Eastwood. I kind of miss the COVID pandemic. The fucking pandemic. Because I was also telling, I don't remember who I was telling. Mm, doesn't matter. Um, 
I, I think about sometimes when I'm traveling and you see like the, you see a homeless person, you know, and I always, I always think for like a split second, I'm a little bit jealous of him because he has nowhere to be no, like no real sense of time because they're like, they're waiting on going anywhere. No one expects anything out of them. No one wants anything from them. Like in that small little dose for just a second, I'm like, man, that's got to feel nice for like, just like a couple days. Just like, no one need anything from you. You don't have to be anywhere. No one's expecting anything. Like you're not having to fix something for someone. I think that'd be nice. But during the COVID pandemic, it was just like, it'd be like, you like you lost sense of days. Like you just wake up and there's nothing to do. There's nowhere to go drink lots of beer in my driveway at noon with my neighbors like i had a lot of fun just hanging out and like really having nowhere to go you make a good case you make it wasn't bad it wasn't bad rebecca's that was her favorite time she wanted the lockdowns to never end see and i didn't i didn't like the lockdowns just because it sucked for a lot of people like and i so and i don't mean to piss off people that they had a really bad experience through covid but Mine wasn't that bad. Like me and my no, kids, no. Did, we did our homework in the mornings. We cooked breakfast together. We hung out. We went to the pool. Like my world that, was just like a lot simpler and a lot of fun. That's what Rebecca loved about it. She said, well, I live for my family. Mm-hmm. We're all here under one roof. She doesn't like to go out. She doesn't right. want to go in. She never wants to leave the house. <laughs> and now you're all forced by government regulations to stay here. <laughs> We can't leave. We're going to hunker in. We're going to stack the cupboards. We're going to lock the doors, and you motherfuckers aren't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. She loved it. I that hated it. I didn't Flips out for the homeless person, freezing cold, absolutely starving, dying for a shower. He's got a really bad, nasty tooth infection, and he has but nowhere, days. But nowhere to be. I understand that point, though, what you're saying. But the rest, the rest of it, I get. Yeah, I, no, and I, I don't no, mean I, to make fun or no. poke fun of people, but I do think that sometimes, like, damn the peace of mind that you have to have in that, just in that sense, like it's gotta be kind of cool. Yeah. Cause I, I think the point you're making, cause I say this a lot when I'm talking to my wife, I'm like years ago when I lived there, the first house that we bought and I just had my little job, you know, but at the factory and whatnot, and we were broke, we were broke, but mm-hmm. it was simpler times. It was. And like, like, don't get me wrong. Like the, the amount of stress that I have to go through these days, and it's like a Crimea River. Okay, fair mm-hmm. enough. But it's stressful. Uh, my it life is. is stressful. Back in the day, I didn't. It didn't matter because I, uh, you know, all right, money was tight, but I didn't give a fuck. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm 100. percent I didn't you. care. I mean, don't get me wrong. Now it's like shit. Got to be careful what I say. Got to do mm-hmm. this. Got to be on a plane. Got to go there. Got to do that. Got to do this. I've got mm-hmm. fucking 50, 100 emails. I got to answer. Right. You know what I mean? No wonder I drink. Bring back COVID for like a week. Just like a week. I was going to say two. Maybe, maybe two. I was going to say maybe two. <laughs> maybe two. Maybe, let's shut it down oh, for a dear. month. Let's shut it down for a month and call it good. One just month out of vacation. every year. Let's shut it down. Just have a vacation. No, because when you go on vacation, then my wife's got all this shit planned. Oh, we got to go here. The vacations on the road. Are the worst. You're in fucking hotels. You're eating, you know, at restaurants. It, no. Just shut the you know, world down for one month. Do you know what Rebecca hates about me? And I probably made myself sound like a dickhead here. Right. So like, because when we go on vacation, and this is the, we're, we're finishing the show on this, I can see the anxiety on Anthony's face. We started early because we needed a show to show and he's got somewhere to be and he's like, he's I do, going like, on about when he goes I just, on vacation. No, no, no. I want to hear the story, but I just got to go it's, after it's this. It's not stuff. a story. Yeah, no, I, dude, I got to go. My neck's <laughs> killing. Um, whenever we check into a hotel, Rebecca dreads it mm-hmm. because I've hyped it up in my head. And I know what we've spent. And I've seen the <laughs> pictures online. But, and I expect a certain something. <laughs> it doesn't look like this. And we get there, and it's disappointing. I am not happy. And she's like, you know, I don't know, get in the room. I'm like, what the fuck is this? It's tiny. She's like, it's not that small. I'm like, it's tiny. You know, I'm like, do you know how much these rooms cost? The whole thing, the whole shebang, all together, it costs this amount, and this is it. Yeah, she's like, oh, mad. God. She's like, she's, she's praying. See, I'm, I'm the it. Rebecca in my family. Where I'm just like, yeah, it's fine. It is what it is. There's no bugs. <laughs> That's what I always say. I just, no it's just because I want everyone to have a good time. Right. I get that. That's the only reason. And that's why I convince everyone that it's okay. Because she's like, well, I don't like that. I'm like, it's fine. Look, it's great. Everyone has a place. We're, we're good to go. 
Yeah. I get it. And we only want you to have a good time. So we hope you did. Subscribe and ring the bell if you haven't done so. We'll be back on Thursday. Take care.